welcome to In the Bin Office Edition, where I don't have my fancy soundboard and I don't have my um, my cool studio effect green screen. But I do have this. The theme, yeah. Now I can't... Um, I can't figure out how to play it in the stream yet. So that will be something that will come with time. But welcome to the office. This is my office here at lovely, livable St. John's University. And uh, welcome to the stream. Welcome to In the Bin uh, Open. I guess this is office hours, if you want to think of it that way. Where we'll just talk about whatever comes up, whatever comes to mind, whatever things are on your mind. And uh, we will talk about rhetoric and argumentation and debate. I'm figuring out how to do this streaming software. So if you notice anything wrong with the stream, if you can't hear me too well or anything like that, just let me know. And we will go from there. George will be by in a little bit. Uh, that's part of the excitement of today's stream is that we'll have George Fitzpatrick here, one of the founding binners the um, best debater you've never heard of, as we talked about before, as we called him on the very first episode. And, you know, it's 2023, and In the Bend started in 2013. So it's been 10 years of the In the Bend podcast. Uh, we're available everywhere. We're available on anchor.fm slash In the Bend. We are available on YouTube. We are available on Twitch. We are available everywhere so any format you're watching this you can always switch to another service of your choice we're also on facebook and i think i made it public on facebook so that if you are not my facebook friend that you can follow along there hopefully i should probably move the microphone to be where the camera is to make sure that uh, i'm not talking away from the microphone all these things have to be worked out, I think, to make this stream professional and good. But anyway, what's on your mind? You can light up the chat. Let me know if you like what we are doing here. Please consider supporting the stream at ko-fi.com slash steviano and give us a donation and I will use it to invest directly into the stream. Um, higher quality or better camera or whatever. But this camera was like $12 and it seems to be doing pretty well. Uh, today I taught my little forgotten class, my um, my uh, hybrid public speaking class, and it was okay. I mean, but uh, one of the things that it really opened up for me was how much work first year students need <clears throat> in the things that I might consider to be very basic critical thinking work. Like, what questions would you, if somebody made a claim like this, based on this evidence, what questions would you follow up with? What would be your follow-up questions to that uh, before you would agree with it? And they had some trouble um, doing that. They were like, well, this one has statistics in it, so it seems pretty good. Um, so we had a lot of work to do in terms of what we might call the classic um, tests of evidence. Um, so we worked on that a little bit today. I can show you what I uh, showed them, and uh, maybe it will give you an idea for what you might want to do in uh, your assignments if you're doing this kind of thing. Here are some of the scenarios I did, and I think I'm going to increase the, the magnification of this because I know that uh, in the last podcast we had, if you watched that one, I thought it was uh, pretty good. And um, see what's it at now? Page width, text width might be better. Oof, a little rough. There we go. So the last one, we talked about how, um, hey, Courtney, what's up? Uh, the, um, the last um, stream that we did with the canonical debate lab, they were saying that maybe the um, maybe the font wasn't big enough for you guys to see. So I thought I would do this now. So I was I made up these exercises to think about tests of evidence, and tests of evidence are kind of an outmoded thing. 
like the most recent stuff I could find on test of evidence on the internet when I was preparing to teach it today were things from um, McBurney and Mills, 1936, public speaking textbook, which I think I might have over here. It's quite an old, I'm a big collector of old textbooks for public speaking and old textbooks for teaching debate and argument. And people know that sometimes they bring them to me. I don't think I have it here. I uh, don't have that one here, but I have a number of great ones, collections of debates and things like that. Um, so these are kind of the scenarios I put up to get them to think through how to do tests of evidence. And one of the things I think it's important to teach when you're doing this now is to, is to try to avoid kind of the way this used to be taught, or the way I used to teach this, which is something... Um, I think is pretty important this idea of silver bullet argumentation i don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before this is a phrase i borrow quite a bit from the great uh i think he's belgian he could be dutch philosopher martin baudry martin baudry writes a lot about the fallacies and he's very famous for a couple of different theories about fallacies that are meta fallacy theories like what the hell are we doing when we're classifying something as a fallacy or talking about fallacies what the hell are we talking about it's a much more difficult question than it first appears because we would say, well, duh, fallacy is an error in reasoning. Well, for Baudry and for people on his side, it's not that clear what that is. And secondly, it's not that clear what to do if we answer the first question. So we let's say we do have a cogent definition or understanding of fallacies. Well, what do we do after we detect one? What happens next? Well, it's unclear. So, um, uh, I think teaching kind of a civic approach to these things, what questions would you ask or what else would you want to know or how would you want to shore up those um, distinctions or differences um, in what they presented versus what you would want to have presented? How do you shore that up? How do you make those connections to where it really um, works for people? Um, I think that's a tough um, thing. I think that's something that we've lost uh, in – public discourse, we've lost that kind of civil approach, like, well, I'd like to agree with you, but I need more evidence instead of like, you're wrong because you're not using the facts. When most of the time when people say that, they're saying you're not using my preferred orientation, which means that your facts are in real static or real disagreement with my preferred orientation towards how the world works. So it's oftentimes not a question of data or a question of warrant and backing if you want to use the toolman language. That's the way I diagnosed that problem. So anyway, these are the things I was doing with my class uh, today. Vert girls chat in U City. What is this? LOL, LOL. Yeah, let's get rid of them. Okay, great. Well, that was interesting, wasn't it? Uh, I haven't had a spammer in a while. So that's good. That shows that the stream is working, I guess. I don't know if we want to talk to... You. Vert girls, free vert girls chat chat in U City. Not very persuasive argument. Okay, so let's look at this first one about human trafficking here. Um, a speaker discussing human trafficking, great topic, and then cites a popular film and shows a clip of the film and then says, this is the experience of millions of people every day. Now, although this might resonate with students or with audiences as true, we might not want to accept it as true unless we had higher quality proof and evidence for it. So this is one that it's like, it's not the right kind of evidence. In fact, some people would argue popular film is not evidence at all, or in this case, it's not evidence. So one of the things that's tough to, to teach people about this is that evidence is very contextual and very, very much depends on the context, the situation in which it's deployed. Uh, sometimes evidence in one sphere would not be evidence in another one. Um, the second one was one where they thought, "Oh, there's not there's not a lot of problems with this one." The second one where one of the one of the re um, heart surgeons says, "Well, ten years ago this worked," and the other one saying, "Well, research from a couple of years ago says that this is not the procedure. This procedure is not reliable." So, which one do we go with? And um, this one, they were like, "Well, that one guy has statistics, so that seems." pretty good um i you know i don't know i think that there's a serious lack of critical thinking practice maybe done in high schools 
because I didn't find these to be that challenging at all. But also, I might have been way off, and I might not have taught it properly. I just kind of lectured on it. Maybe I should assign a reading about tests of evidence, even though it might be kind of old. I should maybe assign some readings about it or something. I don't know. Um, but I just came up with these. I like coming up with little scenarios um, just to kind of show them how easily it is to get duped or to be taken in by particular kinds of um, reasoning that make us feel pretty good. And I, I often talk about Toolman this way, about feeling. We're talking about the Toolman model of argument, how we, we are often feel compelled to agree because we feel like something is true or right or in the right direction. Um, and that, uh, I think, is something that should give us a little bit of pause. And we should try to make sure that we are making the, the correct kind of decision based on what the evidence shows and what, um, or if there is e even the right kind of evidence. Um, so anyway, I was doing that today in my class. And tomorrow in my classes will have speeches. But this is the office, kind of a lovely office. Uh, I had to put a whiteboard in for me. So that when people come by, we can write on the whiteboard and do some teaching. But uh, George will be here in about 20 minutes. Um, what else can we talk about? What's on your mind? Oh, chat. What is on your mind today? Oh, audience. That is one of the best uh, things you can do, I think, in a stream is to offer the vocative case. Oh, audience. What is on your mind? I'm sure there's probably something... Uh, lurking about out there that you might want to speak about. We have a good collection of people tuning in. Uh, I'm going to be here for the next couple of hours, just kind of chilling in the office. It's a warm day here in New York City, 76 degrees out there. 78, my computer's telling me 78 now. I'm getting the latest information. But um, the office stream, hopefully it sounds go good. Hopefully it looks good. Everything looks good on my end, so let me know if you don't think coming through properly or working out well or whatever and i will be very happy to try to adjust the microphone or whatever needs to be done but anyway welcome so test of evidence in my class today um there's not any real good books about this kind of stuff anymore if you look at public speaking textbooks in general they're very very fancy products they have a lot of interesting graphics and a lot of um, justification of kind of um, ways of thinking about audience that come from uh, market research or capitalism or things like that, which is fine. I mean, I'm not opposed to those kind of resources for um, thinking about this stuff. But I do think that some of the ancient world thinking and some of the ancient world um, ideas should be brought into that as well. Different ways of constituting the audience, not just re responding to an audience that pre-exists or an audience that exists outside of um, uh, outside of the moment of speaking to them. So that would be nice to have. But some of the older stuff, I think, is just better. Um, I wish I had some of them to show you, but I think most of the books that are really precious to me are at home. A lot of these books are good for reference for teaching and for school and stuff, but they're not necessarily. Um, the most, um, they're not my favorites, but they're good for referencing for teaching and things like that. So it's pretty good. So yeah, that was my day teaching that class. Talked to my friend Jen, who works in uh, the Career Center, which is a tough job, I think, trying to get trying to get students uh, jobs and stuff. It's kind of busy up here in the office. There's a lot of people in today. It's been pretty good. Maybe we can talk about Twitter. We can also talk about Twitter. I think that's a good thing to discuss. I don't know if you guys have uh, um, been thinking about leaving Twitter. A lot of people on my feet are talking about it. I think it's kind of crazy. Um, let's see. How do I share this stream with other people? Hmm. I guess I can just share, share the Twitch stream. That might be a way of doing it. Oh, the bot is telling my Discord that I'm streaming, but I should probably put that in the Agora. Well, let's go. Hey, 
There we go. Maybe now people will jump in. Since the stream is live, maybe some more people will come by and say hello. Although I'm glad you're here. It'd be nice if we had a few more folks jumping in. It's happy Thursday. Oh, it's George. Hello, George. Hello. Welcome. I told you guys George would be here. And I didn't lie. Here he is with a giant Dunkin' Donuts drink, a concoction of some kind. I'm not sure what what it is he's having. I'm just having water today. I'm trying to drink a lot more water. But um, they were talking about, I was just talking about my day and teaching tests of evidence. Well, that's it. That's all I've talked about so far on the stream. Excellent. Yeah, it's been pretty good. How have you been testing your evidence recently? I have been testing my students' testing of evidence. So I don't know. I feel like I need to teach that more hardcore because it was surprising to me how bad they were at it. But it's not their fault. I mean, I just don't think there's a lot of places to practice um, questioning evidence and questioning support for claims. But uh, I got the idea to teach it today because tomorrow is the big election. That's another thing we talk about. We talk about the election. Look at some look at some debate clips. Look at some uh, campaign ads. I'm going to be kind of fun. Yeah. I'm going to be good, too. I don't really have a plan for today. So whatever you guys in the audience want to talk about, I will talk about it with you. But uh, the thing about teaching tests of evidence is teaching two things that are big challenges. It's not hard to get people to say, oh, that claim doesn't have enough evidence or there's not enough support for that claim. That's pretty easy to do. That's kind of textbooky. But what's tough is to have them do it in a civil, a civil way and in a civic way appropriate for the context, appropriate for the, for the, um, where they are in the world or who they're talking to and what the situation is. And then also not to feel sheepish or bad if they're wrong about something, which is really weird. I started thinking about that quite a bit after the last podcast, I was thinking, oh my gosh, like how crazy is it that we teach people that they should be demure and hang their head when they're wrong? No wonder we have so many problems. We associate being wrong with a failure instead of why is that not a success? I think we, it, it just shows that as a society, we value consistency over, oh, I think we value consistency over being over process, over actually striving to be yeah. better after starting to be more correct. We almost prefer someone who is just loud wrong, but consistent loud wrong. Yeah. I think it's like, it's hard to get over that. Um, feeling of pride like oh i was right i was right initially i'm right today i've never wavered and that's like a, a, a thing about pride is like my instincts were correct but really it's like um we shouldn't be valorizing instinct over looking at different sets of data from different points of view like here's this information from this point of view how does it relate to this situation how does it help us judge um this issue uh, how would the judgment change? We had a different point of view, that kind of thing. So that was the one thing. So responding in a civic way and a civil way are the two things I was thinking about. Not to say, oh, oh, you don't have enough evidence. Your facts are wrong. You're an idiot. Alternative facts or whatever. And then also a way of doing it in a way to say, I really do want to believe you, but I can't believe you given the information you have provided. That information has problems with it, including this, 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 this. So that was that. Those are kind of the challenges I think to it. But maybe I should like bring that stuff into the public speaking class a lot more because they were so they really struggled with it. I don't think they're alone. Yeah, well, that's true. We all kind of struggle with it. Here's the um, Here's what I was showing them, the little scenarios I came okay. up with. I don't know if you can read from where you are. You can sort of. There's a little bit. There's a little bit next to you. Can come, you can come close. Come close, George. I was just making sure I didn't fall victim to the wild gesticulating. So it's no, you can one. you can wildly gesticulate. So it's hard to read because I have my camera equipment and stuff in front of the monitor, but maybe you can read it and see what you think. This is what we were talking about in class today. They had some trouble with it. Yes, please enter. Hello, Hello, welcome. Is this a bad time? No, no, it's a great all. time. It's a great time to come in. Pull a chair up. Is this? Yes. Really? We're putting we're putting you in the bin. Oh, I'm in the bin. Yes. May I be in the bin? Sure, yes, of course. Oh, thank you. We can keep the door cracked just so people don't like. That way, people can like peek in and. Mm -hmm. We have to change the camera angle now. Oh, now we have. Look, we have a full crew. Sorry, I the <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, I expected a lot more uh, people to come, but we're only twenty minutes in. So. Okay. But anyway, I was talking about teaching my class and how um, we were doing 
tests of evidence, which is kind of an old idea. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you test the evidence of a claim and see what was needed to be there? And I was talking about, we have the silver bullet approach, the classic silver bullet approach, where it's like, oh, you made a mistake with your evidence. You're wrong. Dismiss. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of the way we are now, is that you made a technical error, so goodbye. You are not listening to facts. You are stupid. This kind of stuff. So how do we how do we teach that in a way that's like civil and civic, so appropriate to the form? I, I want to believe you, but I can't with this evidence. Right. And how do I ask for more evidence against somebody who I, I think is probably like a blowhard? I think number one is actually a really good example to illustrate that. Because mm -hmm. if we're just looking at number one inherently, there's nothing like I guess the main thing that would be off about it is there isn't just a lot justifying what the international harms are and the fact that there are millions of people going through it the fact that the film is really the only specific evidence that she's mm -hmm. going that that the speaker is going into mm -hmm. but a lot of that is setting up a fairly believable narrative and the idea of going into a film illustrating it, like humanizing the nature of what people going through human trafficking are going through is not a bad thing to do during a speech it just it might be insufficient for proving the exact points that she's going into. So it's not as if the stuff there is just bad or wrong or like, or, or, or that there's some sort of outrageous misinformation going on there. It's just that it might be a little bit insufficient for making the exact claims that she's making in the course of the speech. Yeah. It's just like, it's a little light. Yeah. I think, uh, I think, it, I think it's very, I think it's really highly much more problematic than you're characterizing you what why would you say that because well i see this all the time i probably should rewrite it but do you have anything you want to say about it, isabel this um, is isabella by the way everybody hi, isabella. um i feel like i'm still i want to hear you guys talk more because i feel like i don't really yeah. i'm not really on the same page as you guys well i think it's like a very common thing it's like when you're listening to we don't have the tools so you're listening to somebody try to prove something to you mm -hmm. and you're like I mean, it makes sense, but there's just not, this evidence just isn't very good. You get that weird feeling. Yeah. yeah. Like, how do you address, how do you name it and how do you make specifics out of it? So this first one, I think, is I hear all the time, especially now, because students really want to talk about mental health all yeah. the time. Right. And they will use, like, um, a, a movie and say, this is what it's like to be bipolar. Mm -hmm. And I'm like... Is it? I mean, it's like a popular film, you know, it seems like weak evidence. Now, this might be true. This first one is hard because it might be true that human trafficking affects millions of people, but we wouldn't want to just go on our gut. I know. I agree. And yeah. that's the and that's the thing. And like, popular films are not very good evidence because the filmmaker and the studio are, always are going putting, for entertainment, not going for accuracy of the of the situation. Yeah, necessarily. They're, yeah, they're going for profit. Yeah. So this is why CNN is also not a good source. Or this is why MSNBC or Fox are not a good source because they're going for viewership and making money over some kind of broader accuracy. They can be accurate, but it's not. Yes, I would, I would say I, I would say rather than say the blanket that they're not a good source, that they have issue that they may have issues that where there might be insufficient sources in and of themselves. Yeah. They have motives other than just saying the truth all the time. Yeah, and sometimes those motives are not in contradiction of what we'd want. But sometimes they are. Prove, but sometimes they're. It's good to be well aware of it. So this one, I should probably, now I'm thinking about it, I should probably rewrite this for mental health because that would catch every student. They'd be like, yep, mental health impacts millions of people every day. That's true. It's a good, that's a good argument, but it's actually a very poor argument because there are better sources one could use to you. Along with the film, you could of course show the clip of the film, but then you need to provide more data from better sources. Oh no, and I wasn't, dis and I wasn't disagreeing with you on that. Like yeah. it's not proving the point that it's an international yeah. problem. It's not proving the point that millions of people right. are going through it. Right. But I think the idea of bringing up the film is not a bad thing to do in and of it, in yeah. and of itself, especially if it's popular it's good and it might be a good way to get people to say like, oh, we've all seen this recent film. Like you, you understand what this character went through. And at least if you're correct, and if you, at least if you're diligent about what you pick in terms of it fitting with the facts that you know about the situation mm -hmm. and not necessarily just going for the things that are like maybe more exaggerated or maybe more sensationalized about the situation. Mm -hmm. I think it's a perfectly ethical thing to do as a speaker. It actually might help connect with the audience yeah. a little bit better, but if it's your only evidence to try to prove both of those things, it's not even close to sufficient to do that. Yeah. I agree. I've seen, I've seen students do that with autism too. They'll show like a clip from the good doctor or something. Oh, oh man. This is what autistic people are like. 
I've, I've seen a lot of complaints about the good doctor though and i mean that's the same thing right because it, it makes money because this is something that neurotypical people that consume it are like oh this seems to me like something that a person with autism you know that's Mm-hmm. It, it, they're selling a version of autism that people want to buy, but a lot of people with autism disagree yeah. with it. Or like, um, what's that other show, that show I hate? Um, um, that that, big, that covers a lot. That's true. They yeah. discover a lot. Big Bang Theory. Oh, right. The, and big Sheldon, big Sheldon is, a, yeah. is a, yeah. The, the, the frustrating thing for me is you just lay that, that like, no big deal. We can go the anywhere. frustrating thing for me is, so aut- like autism spectrum disorders are an umbrella condition. You can like, there are probably there are probably some people that with autism that have some similarities to the main character in the good doctor who I'm blanking uh, Sean Murphy Dr. Murphy that who I'm blank I was just blanking on the name of for a second but that is not a holistic portrayal of the way the condition comes across i have debates with i have adhd for example which is also a condition that presents in a number of different ways and I have arguments with my friends all the time about like things that affect us differently in terms of like different symptoms we have or different ways our condition presents. So like, I, I think that it is very, it is very much a toxic thing to rely on, to rely on media and film and television to be presenting a holistic view of a condition that does not present with a holistic set of condition that does not present with a holistic set of like, you know, behaviors and conditions that go with it it's just a ridiculous thing to expect honestly yeah and i'm not blaming and like yes and that is not to deflect all the blame away from like the producers of the good doctor and like playing into the idea of like savant syndrome and other stuff like that and the idea that stuff that that might be fairly problematic to the way to the, to the way that we view autism as a society but I also think that we have to get away from the idea that every single presentation of a condition on screen is meant to be the the be all end all presentation of a condition on screen, especially one that we know does not have that as an option, does not have yeah. that, that 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 we that we know from our scientific uh, research on the condition does not have a single way to present. We have to stop pretending like like we have to just stop going after every presentation of of uh, of these conditions on screen like they have to capture everything. There's going to be situations where it's going to be different than Mm. people's experience because not everyone's experience with an autism spectrum disorder is the same. And it's, and there's no way to capture that. Yeah. No, I think it's well said. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I think you're hundred percent right. I I think that that's my problem with the media. Like I don't, with using something like a film as Mm. evidence. um, And even the media can't be the same thing. George, the media can't be broad brushed like that. Yeah. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. I I just wanted to say that. Um, but Go ahead, I, share your view. <laughs> I mean, I agree, and I think I think that's the problem with using something like a film. Not necessarily that like it's done in bad faith, but that it, it sort of primes an audience to receive all the information they're going to receive through the lens of the film. Um, mm. So you're kind of not really leaving the audience with as much room to interpret the information that they're about to receive in the way that they would naturally interpret it if they didn't have a filmmaker trying to impose a certain emotional lens upon their viewing. Yeah. It, so almost as if the films, uh, not to to go back to go to a podcast here, and hopefully this is a fair interpretation of what you're saying, Isabel, almost as if the film, you, you're worried that the film acts as almost a terministic screen for all the rest of the information Absolutely. where it's a, S- selecting, deflecting, reflecting everything else that you're saying in the speech in a particular way for the audience. Hooray for Kenneth Burke reference <laughs> so early in the podcast. I'm so happy. No, that's made my day. Absolutely it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think also maybe it would also change example number one if it was a documentary too. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, um, stu- young students or students who are new to the university have trouble differentiating uh, a documentary from a film. Really. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that. They're like, oh, you know, and they're like, okay, what's the difference between a documentary and a film? But, I mean, maybe that's just because of the artistic nature of of uh, filmmaking now. Yeah. Um, and how docu- yeah, docudramas or uh, Werner Herzog, are those documentaries or are they something else? That, you know, they're kind of something else in, in my view. Right. But then also you have creative nonfiction. And so creative nonfiction writing is something that I think has really changed, like really, really good books 
Are they nonfiction? Or, or like are they fiction? Rom yeah. Romana clefts or stuff like that, where it's like yeah, it's be, a nonfiction yeah. story, but it's written as fiction for legal reasons, like uh, yeah, like uh, uh, the Devil Wears Prada and stuff like that, where it's mm -hmm. clearly about Anna Wintour and they're just trying to avoid getting sued. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, it's it, but I would almost take a step back from that and say I think that we don't want to hagiography documentaries either, because there's quite a few problems in the way that those are presented and that editing. And the opportunities that documentaries present can oftentimes be very distortive in and of yeah. themselves. One example that I like to use for my students about maybe not taking documentaries as wholesale truth um, is the film Super Size Me, which oh. had a oh, huge, yeah, yeah, yeah. huge impact on like literally took Super Size off the menu at McDonald's. And we didn't find out for 15 years that there was this scene, pretty important scene in the middle of the film where Morgan Spurlock goes to his doctor and the doctor's like, your health is terrible. You're in pretty significant liver failure here and the film fairly strongly implies that it is his diet of like all mcdonald's for like the past at this point i think like over two weeks yeah that is causing this but what we didn't know and we did not know this until like the speaking until like the you know time's up speaking out movement where he got called out for being um for like sexual misconduct is that he is in he, is that during the filming of this movie and before this and even after this is that he was an alcoholic and that yeah. might have had something to do yeah. and that his presentation of himself as like a normal like 30 something year old person was just completely inaccurate to the course of the film and that blaming his liver failure that the doctor was seeing on McDonald's was a completely unfair presentation but at that point McDonald's had already changed its image on the basis of the film that the the the, the the persuasion had already been done. Yeah. This has been long, it, this has been long past like the cultural moment where this occurred. And it didn't matter that like the presentation actively distorted and left out a fairly relevant piece of like a, a very relevant variable out of the equation in this using himself as a case study for eating McDonald's for the course of 30 days. So I think that that really tells you the dangers of necessarily using documentaries for this there website there's a website that i'm bl blanking on the name of that rates like the factual accuracy of documentaries oh. and on 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 the hmm. whole about half of the facts that a documentary presents are can can be said to be like fully accurate and yeah. there's some where it's completely off the rails yeah. obviously so i am not going to come out here and say that you should that i think that there could be plenty of situations in which documentaries can be sensationalized and fictionalized well beyond the point where well beyond the point of even works of explicit works of fiction so I, I just even tell my students like don't necessarily say because this isn't a documentary it's it's gospel i think kyrie irving found that out the hard way about two weeks ago yeah i think that kyrie irving is a good a good example of this of like how bad people are at determining it's really hard to know what questions to ask. It's very easy to do the Monday morning quarterback thing and say, oh, yeah. And then we found out that he lied about his alcoholism or whatever. That doesn't really help us in the moment. Um, so the idea of this is like, what are those questions you should ask about any piece of evidence that comes your way? Um, I think in the Kyrie Irving anti-Semitism thing, I think what happened there is that he got the idea from people he trusted like Kanye West and other people. And he thought, Oh, there must be something to this because I respect those people and right. they have shown me a lot of good stuff. Like, so I have all these examples that I, I go over in class are all kind of different. This one's like a respected businessman talks about reading the UN report. And he's like, the UN report said that carbon dioxide and methane are going down. So that's the end of the global warming theory. Cause those are the gases that are supposed to, contribute to it. So that's the end of it. So it's like, well, how do you talk to somebody like that? It's easy for any of us to fall, to fall prey to this stuff. But I think that figuring out the method, what's the method of asking the questions after a source to make sure that you are satisfied in the right way, not just your feeling or the magnetic pull you have towards something that resonates with you is true, but how did, how to get, how to get those questions. And that's what the tests of evidence always were for me and it's just uh, it's a bit disturbing how little i could find out there from other classes or other people's courses or other uh public speaking or debate courses where i don't just don't think this is really being taught that much anymore. No. how do i ask those questions after uh, because the idea i guess what's fallen out of favor which is kind of scary on this election day eve happy election day eve 
is that uh, what's fallen out of favor is this idea of like, well, I just wouldn't ever need to question the other side's arguments or evidence because I will never believe the other side. That's a scary thought. Because they are evil. I mean, that's a that's a scary thought. Yeah, it's like straight up tribalism. So you don't need the test of evidence if it's straight up tribalism. That is what we're um, facing. So I don't know. It was just kind of you don't need a test of evidence if the other side has already yeah. failed the test of character. I guess, or or they are just the bad side. Yeah. I mean, I was even thinking this when you were talking earlier, Professor Yano. Like um, when you were mentioning, you know, anyone who's paid, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that that reduces your your room for for certainty to such like a small margin because you know even your professors right like they're yeah. i just came from a class where a professor showed us the uh the docudrama bombshell and that you know that's that's pedagogy for him yeah right um, right and it's like okay this i'm i'm putting my stamp of approval on this as a professor and saying that this is worth knowing yes yeah. yes this film about the fox News situation is directed by the austin powers guy is obviously completely accurate right. yeah. austin powers and yeah, no, it really is. And yeah. Even your professors, you know, to a certain extent, like, you know, that's a that's a person that's that's paid, right? Mm -hmm. to, that's to, true. to do a certain you know, to speak yeah. in a certain way. So yeah, what is big professor not want <laughs> you to know? <laughs> big university. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so what like if you're if you reduce it even down to like anybody who's who's paid to talk about something, even that is not even necessarily like a reliable test of whether or not you should listen to someone because do we just stop listening to professors because they're paid to talk about something? Uh, you know, I'll have to bring something up about that because I think it's pretty good. But right now I'm having a boomer moment in the control of my Microsoft Word because I want to show something about, about this exact thing that we were talking about. Um, oh, I did, I did find the In the Bin theme music, but I couldn't figure out how to play it on the stream properly without it <laughs> sounding horrible. So I didn't do it. I played it for like one second. So if you're here for the In the Bin theme music, I'm sad to disappoint you. I mean, that's all I can do. Don't worry, the Gen right. the, 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 don't worry, we will not, for, we will forgive you for your Gen X moment. Yeah, so. Oh. Is this the, let's see. I guess I'll just bring this up first, because we can talk about this. So when you're thinking about the test of evidence and who it is that needs to be, um, should we not listen to professors because they're paid? It brings up, in my mind, Gramsci mm -hmm. and the idea of um, of uh, organic and institutional intellectuals. Here's Gramsci's Wikipedia page. I'm going to learn my lesson from the from last week. And, in big in it. In big in it. Yep. It's going to be in big in it. So there he is. Yeah. So he spent most of his life in prison and he wrote. Uh, in notebooks all the time. And they're called the prison notebooks and they're published. And Gramsci's prison notebooks, you can go look at. But I think the most, one of the most important contributions that he made was about the idea of what's an intellectual and where they come from. And so he was kind of the OG of this, like, um, university professors are institutional intellectuals. So there's only so far they'll go. So for example, your professor showing you um, Bombshell is like institutionally relying on another institution and a particular way of expose and a particular way of truth finding. And I mean, expose and research presented dramatically is an ideological commitment. So um, what Gramsci's saying is intellectuals who are come from institutions will not vary from that. They will always have loyalty to the institution, but organic intellectuals don't have that. They come from the bottom up, they come from the streets. And they don't have that kind of um, that kind of limit. So organic intellectuals are the people who we should be listening to. And those are the people who are truly revolutionary. They don't have any commitments. I've seen that idea um, all over lately. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's that's such a tough question then, because you know, how do you? Because institutions do come with the idea of, you know, there, there's some sort of credential. It, it comes with almost the idea of like a that there's some sort of verification. Like it's it's a built-in uh, test of, of mm -hmm. trustworthiness, right? Like if, oh, okay, somebody has vetted this person to see what they know, so that means that yeah. I can so, trust them. Yeah, the PhD serves as that. But the yeah. PhD is like under fire these days. Yeah. It's like an antiquated kind of way of determining that. And then there's also like the idea of like uh, all these all the suspicion that's going around about uh, are professors liberally biased? Mm -hmm. And then professors saying, yes, of course, because education makes you liberally biased. I wonder if that's the best response to that. Uh, I feel like there are, I feel like there are better there are better kinds of responses to that. 
you know, sort of thing. Did I close in my boomer moment? Did I close the thing we were talking about? No, it's still here. Yeah, it's not We can bring that up later. But anyway, yeah, I was just talking about the exercise I was doing. But yeah, the question is still out there about how do you create how do you create that question asking process about claims you see that we would call critical thinking, like asking critical questions about stuff. It really does need a mechanical kind of method to it. And I'm just kind of shocked at how bad people's methods are with in relation to this. But anyway, uh, trust trusting your professors? I don't know. Trust them as much as uh, you would uh, as the institution. But I mean, they're not, I, I don't think they're hundred percent right. I think they're, I think there's too many credentialing things in there. The undergraduate degree, the master's degree, the PhD, the tenure process raises a lot of suspicion or should raise suspicion in a critically minded person. Yeah. That, that's not a bad thing to be suspicious of people who are telling you what's what. That's what I'd say. So. I would agree with that. I'd lose mm -hmm. respect for my students if they agreed with me all the time. Mm -hmm. Probably and, means they're not thinking. And then you would fail them. Yes. That's what I do <laughs> all the time. What if you just have a student that's really similar to you? That you've confused. Does them. that happen? Has that happened to you? Not usually. There's a student who's very similar. There hasn't been like some Hawaiian shirted menace walking into my classroom. Oh, yet. Hawaiian shirted menace, <laughs> a new nickname for George. This is very good. Very nice. Yep. Yeah, well, uh, not a lot going on in the chat. We had free vert girls chat in U City. <laughs> Can we not bring attention to the spam, Steve? That's the only. And then Courtney said, "Yeah," but that's it. So I think that um, I would like to hear from the chat. What you guys want us to talk Can about? Do for it. Sorry. Yeah, you want to see the screen? Yeah, absolutely. Or the scenarios? We can talk more about these scenarios. But what's up with you guys today? What's uh, on your mind, Oben? Oben members. I mean, I listened to the previous podcast. Uh, oh, yeah, it was canonical debate. Yeah, and I have a thought on my mind. I'm uh -huh. not sure it's fully formed. I'm not sure if I agree with what I'm about to say. I'm. This is some. Reckless ideological speculation. Okay, that I'm, about to do. I'm ready. Some reckless speculation. Let's go. I love that. Let's so go. I am concerned that we keep trying to fight like misinformation with more with with just fact checking with more and more different names, mm -hmm. and I believe that that is. And I'm not trying to put words in the mouth of like our great our great partners over there, but I think that is to some extent what they're doing, where it is just. Essentially, every time like some more information comes up, here's this big blob of like, you know, information related to the topic that just comes there. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we're really trying to diagnose the problem of why people are starting to become more tribal or more polarized, if we look at the evidence that we have for it, one of the studies on social media that we've seen, what it actually says is, that the more and more someone engages in political speech on social media, the more and more polarized they get, not in terms of their ideology, not in terms of their beliefs, not in terms of like what views they express in terms of like where they are in the political compass, mm -hmm. but in terms of their identification, in terms of how it affects their identity. Like they identify as more liberal or conservative mm -hmm. or more Democrat or Republican or whatever the exact compass is and what you're doing. And the interesting part is, and this is the part that I think in the study I read, in this point, the study is about six or seven years old, and I will try to send a link to it to Steve so he can send it out to the bin listeners if I can find it again. To the, to the bin world. To the, bi to, the to the binners. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. The binners. Yes. To the binners. Um, to the bin enjoyers. The one, you like that, the, the interesting part about it is you think that this would happen more often if someone was in an echo chamber where they were interacting with people who shared their views. But in fact, that doesn't really matter. And it actually happens if you even have a pretty heterogeneous set of people that you follow and interact with politically. So even if you interact with people that you regularly both agree with and disagree with, you still find this polarization effect. Mm -hmm. So I think that we've been diagnosing this problem of like echo chambers and like, you know, enclaves of like groups of people. And certainly that is a problem when we look at like certain communities. Like obviously I'm not going to argue that like, like, um, like, you know, organization, like, you know, forums and organizations and echo chambers like Stormfront haven't had like massive drastic effects on like our politics and things like that. But what I am saying is that I believe that what we're going through right now, if we look at the way that we kind of know that our brains are wired, is that I believe that social media 
in general and the internet in general is causing this sort of information overload for us. And that what this information overload is doing is causing our brains revert back to what they do naturally. And I think that we have this assumption that we've been taught that human beings are this very rational species. But to be honest, confirmation bias is really kind of what our brains are designed to do more than think rationally about a lot of subjects. Imagine if every new piece of information that you heard, that you had to vet through every other like I attitude, belief and value that you had on a regular basis, you would go insane. Most of the time, your brain, unless this is a very specific piece of information, is just going to sort this and have it not really affect most of the views that you have on a regular basis. Confirmation bias is like sort of a tool to keep yourself sane, keep yourself um, like keep your mind working, keep yourself bless thinking you, like everything you. is OK. Oh, God, you had I don't COVID? Have, I don't have it. I just have a little COVID. Yeah. Oh God. So my in respiratory inflammation. So the so so what I'm worried here is if we just present people with it, like I think one of the reasons why fact check we haven't really seen fact checking work all that well, and why just presenting people with a list of information on 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 related to a subject isn't going to work, is that what this information overload is going to do is just going to send people back to the narratives and worldviews that they've already had, and that we've seen the fact that like in the absent like that there's all these compelling counter that without like sort of a compelling counter narrative it's really difficult to fight misinformation i know it's hard to think about this but before the first anti-vax the current anti-vax crisis one of the big ones that we had was the theory that came out of like that forged paper in the lancet uh, published by Andrew Wakefield, that the MMR vaccine was connected to autism. You remember this whole controversy, mm -hmm. Steve, in the 90s. I do, yeah. Right. And that um, it caused uh, it caused mm -hmm. measles vaccination rates to drop. And a huge part of the reason for that was because um, there were a number of parents who just reported changes in their kids because the time in which you would notice an autism spectrum disorder developing and the time in which you give, the, give a child an MMR vaccine are pretty are around the same period of time in which you notice a condition, the condition developing. So that narrative became very powerful for a lot of parents and it became very easy to convince themselves that. See, that's another in test the of, evi of evidence is uh, proximity. Right. Know? So the post hoc. Right. The, but, the, um, the, I think the correlation that the, doesn't equal causation. The, that right. problem. Yeah. yeah. Post hoc fallacy. I think that um, one of the most important things in everything that you said there, which is a lot, I think the most important thing is that the research is pretty much in on confirmation bias. And that research says that, yeah, we are designed to think that way. And it's actually a huge evolutionary advantage to beings that are meant to work in collective groups. Uh, and that's the uh, Mercier and Sperber stuff in Enigma of Reason and all their work and their in their papers on cognitive um, evolutionary cognitive psychology. I think I have that right. But uh, these things that are um, uh, that we are identifying as problems to overcome are actually um there's a lot of evidence these are evolutionary adaptations. And so why would um, confirmation bias be an evolutionary adaptation? Well, because when we would look at a bunch of options and we're in a group, we would pick the one that we thought was the most convincing to ourselves and then share that one with everybody else in order to get people moving on something pretty quick. But compensatory to that is this kind of um, doubt that we also recognize as a problem, which is the problem that we face now in like, you know, we're having elections tomorrow, so we're having this problem This problem of people being like, oh, but you never really know what the truth is. Oh, but you're, you know, this kind of constant doubt kind of thing. And both of these are because we kind of live in less collective, shared spaces. Yeah. We're all kind of, um, this is my stuff. Everyone's trying to take my stuff. We're less Everybody's comfortable with against each other. Yeah. yeah, I don't know my neighbors. Um, we all live in our little, our little houses. We don't really know our neighbors. We don't work collectively on anything. So I think that all that is um, absolutely a big problem. So trying to, I think if you want to take the approach of where you're going to say, well, let's eliminate these fallacies or let's eliminate confirmation bias. You have a lot of trouble to do a lot of trouble to overcome. Uh, but if you want to say, let's take um, confirmation bias and let's create some methods and some things that uh, would let us use that for a positive spin. I don't even know what that would look like. But I mean, I think part of it is maybe um, what I talked about at the beginning of the show, like the, the idea of pride and celebration when you're wrong is a point yeah. of pride. Um, that'd be good. But I was just kind of shocked about how bad 
um, the students were at identifying this stuff. So we have a couple of comments here I want to address. First of all, Greg from Facebook, Mr. Mayo himself. Uh, I used to work with Greg uh, back in the old, back in the days when I was a high school teacher. He was oh. a high school debate coach for a long time. Everyone, hello, Greg. everyone says hello. I'm glad you like my office. They gave me this whiteboard. Uh, this is actually a pretty decent office. I have this ancient bookcase. Ye old. Here it is. Double, triple stacked with books that aren't even really my favorite books. So it's kind of like. Um, but yeah, um, uh, public forum. Is public forum super popular? I understand now it's a TOC bid. So I think that's kind of crazy. We'll talk a little high school debate lingo here for those of you who, for those of you thinking the bin has given up the ghost of intercollegiate debate or competitive debate, tournament debate. No, it has not. Uh, it's too much a part of, us. yeah, the specter is haunting Steve and the specter of tournament debate to steal from Mark's there a little bit, but, um, public forum is a crazy format. Um, a little wacky. Uh, yeah, it's just crazy, but it's crazy. The craziest thing about it is how incredibly popular it's become. We can talk about public forum debate in a second. Um, let's see what Bentley had to say. Bentley was our guest last week. Um, so the canonical debate lab does add information, he's saying. This is a great comment. I wish the whole thing would be put on here. I wonder if we can. How do we put the entire comment on there? I don't know. We're still we're still learning. But um, we're this comment, again. if you're watching on Twitch, this comment's on Twitch. So um, the idea that um, uh, cognitive load and overload, I, I want to talk about information overload a little bit too, because this is an interesting thing too, because we are really, really good at identifying the um heart of a debate i think any that's what's so funny like these students are have a lot of trouble uh, questioning or like coming up with the questions that would help the person provide the evidence to agree with them more but they're very very good at being like what would be the arguments you'd hear in a debate about this and they can identify all those common places so we're pretty good at that they need some refinement of that but i feel like you can go in any class and do that i don't know if your students are that way george or sometimes yeah sometimes if you feel like that would be the way that you're experiencing isabel's an undergrad so yeah um i don't know if that's the experience you've had in your classes um, of the actually, ability of people to say well here's the arguments i expect to come up and it's a pretty decent map yeah um, although um i most of my classes right now are legal studies, and I find that my legal studies friends who are used to very like legalistic thinking, um, for them that's actually a real problem because they're unable to step out of those, uh, those boxes. And it really sometimes they actually can't even essentialize properly because they, they get too caught up in what they think the heart of an argument should look like. Mm -hmm. Objection, um, relevance. Yeah. And it's like, actually, if you give this two seconds of explanation, this is quite relevant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, my philosophy friends are a little better at that. But, uh, yeah, um, yeah, and relevance is always shifting. I think part of the problem with all this, too, is that people are very uncomfortable with shifting burdens. Yes. They think that a fact is a fact. And a fact is a fact, but it's also not a fact at the same time. People can't keep that in their head. We are very, very, very anti-context right now. But yeah, that's um, the, that drives yes. you crazy. Yeah. Like, what does so this bad. mean? Like, people will just oftentimes say things and expect that they – that whatever version of it in their head that they've contextualized the audience is going to contextualize the same way and that can often be the furthest thing from the truth yeah wow. i mean that's like the um the neil degrasse tyson enjoyers yeah right these yeah. people are problematic because they'd be like well science is always true but no scientists ever say that say yeah. science is a process by which we uncover theories that allow us to operate and do good in the world and help people and do amazing things but it's not true in that sense of like once science has discovered something they put it on a shelf in a little display box and that's the end of it yeah. it's never that way you know we, it's always if, being if science um, thought examined. that we never would science never would have discovered relativity because no. they still would be they would still be on newton's laws of physics like yeah from, and then yeah. 500 years like you know and without relativity where would we serve all this thanksgiving food yeah. exactly i mean not to your parents not to not to my relatives because there would be no theory of relativity nope Maybe this is like a little off topic, but no, there's no know. off topic here. This is, by the way, if you're just turning in, this is called like the grab bag show. So you can just fire off whatever you want to hear us talk about, and we're happy to do it. Potpourri, the as they call it on Jeopardy. Oh, it is the Pope. You know, I've been playing Jeopardy on my Switch on Nintendo Switch. I didn't know they had Jeopardy. It was eight dollars. My friend Catherine, yeah, my yep. friend Catherine was like, "Let's go buy it and we play each other." We played against each other once. It was fun. But what I like is that every day there's a daily challenge. I'm doing pretty well in Potpourri. That is fun. But uh, yeah, this is kind of the potpourri episode, argument, debate, potpourri. 
Um, so if, if you want us to talk about something, chat, you can you can let us know. I'll put up here for those of you who might have been not been here for the beginning of the show. I'll put it here again where, where we started, which is my test of evidence exercises I was doing in class today. And just how easy it is for us to fall into these traps of like, I guess what I'm thinking of now is the Toolman model is really, really powerful and useful for thinking about that magnetic pull that we have. Uh, towards a conclusion where we're like, oh yeah, that just feels right. Yeah. And how we need to put the brakes on that. I'm not saying it's bad to feel like a conclusion is warranted because that's the way argument works and that's the way debate works is that we feel very good. And like intercollegiate debate, much to the chagrin of people who teach it or um, anybody who teaches tournament oriented debate, much to their, they try to hide this. It's always like, yeah, I feel like that team did the better debating. Let me now go justify it through the yeah. decision of the rules and talking about what you dropped or whatever. Right. But that's always a looking backwards kind of thing. So um, I feel like this team won and here's why, uh, but you know, that would kind of like ruin the game because it right. wouldn't be seen as objective. But I was trying to think of different ways of different scenarios that'd be pretty realistic and being like, how would you push on this in a civil civil way to try to get better evidence out of the person or to show why you can't agree even if that claim is true i have an obligation not to agree just because the evidence is so weak so this is a nice way to check yourself is to have more of a prideful commitment towards evidence quality or evidence um, tests of it whether it's relevant good representative recent thorough enough of it all these kind of things i think are very 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 important questions to ask. So I'd written these scenarios a long time ago, and I think they're pretty... I, I feel like really they're... like okay. number three. Number three is a good one. The one about the... the businessman? The one about the climate. I think that's a good that's a good test of reasoning there. Yeah. Because somebody might be respected as a thinker in one place in the world, but do we know if this guy has the capacity to read this report and understand that even if those numbers are going down, climate change is still occurring or there still needs to be action on climate change or yeah. the theory is still relevant, even if those gases how, are going how down. How much are they going? Yeah. How much are they going down? Like, are, like did yeah. methane and carbon dioxide cease being greenhouse gases somehow? Like, you know. Yeah. It's not as simple as the gas concentration. Right? Yeah. Uh, that, that would be my Gas goes question. up, gas goes down. You can't explain that. And also, there's also something else here that could come out, which is the idea that maybe the businessman might be a little biased against uh, climate change because it might be to the benefit of, we don't know what business is in. Maybe it might work in his favor to you. He He's in the maybe. business of capitalism, Steve, obviously. Maybe this is Rex Tillerson. The worst thing ever. The worst thing ever, capitalism. I mean, I was, I was I'm going to sell shirts and say that, make a ton of money. <laughs> of course. It's gonna That's be awesome. Do you know? Do you know how many? Do you know how many? Do you know how many Marxists are gonna buy? They're are gonna buy those shirts that you're gonna make in some sweatshop and in, in some in some standard conditions. It's already been done. It's a Che Guevara t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> People Marxists love buying Che Guevara t-shirts. Oh yes. my god, it's so true. Blue Horseshoe loves Che, che Guevara t-shirt company. <laughs> Blue Horseshoe loves Che Guevara. Yeah. Um, that juxtaposition is amazing. Let's see. I have a bunch of these here. I think this McDonald's one is very funny. And then I don't remember writing these. I wrote them so long ago. This Toyota one is just really odd. I, like I it. think these are good exercises to get people thinking, okay, how do I respond to this person without saying you're wrong or you don't understand what evidence is or you're stupid? How do I respond to them in a way that keeps the argument and the claim process going? Because I'm a firm believer in the idea that um, uh, the way argument works is in collective exchange and engagement. So you have to keep the you have to keep the conversation going. You can't just end it, which is like the problem with silver bullet argument and yeah. debate theories, which are like, oh, you're wrong. Conversation. So, over. so Bentley says something really interesting in the in the chat here. Shoot, uh, can you pull that up real quick? Sure. Most recent thing. Absolutely. Let me stop sharing my screen and start sharing. So Bentley you judging evidence on a scale seems like people just often accept or reject. That's right. I mm -hmm. disagree with the accept. And reject binary. I think, I think people true. do that all the time. I mean, you know, people do that all the time. I'm saying that that's not a binary that they should use, but a scale, I don't know if it's something that could be like turned into a number or a gradient or, you know, a spectrum or something like that where it can be measured. But I, I do think it's like we should take the advice of the London underground and mind the gap. You know what I mean? I think like you should look at when you look at an evidence, when you look at a piece of evidence, 
you kind of try to map out in your head. It's like, what's actually missing from this for it to be, for me to be as persuaded as I could be. Yeah. Like, that's, maybe the, I that's the classic exactly. test of evidence. Yeah, right exactly. There. But, but like, it's hard for me to say that like, going up to the first example, it's like, I find this evidence like a four out of 10 or something like that. Like, like, uh, like I'm rating it like Bret Hart's rating a triple H match. Mm -hmm. Like I, it's, it's hard for me to put it into those words, but you have to find like, like the, some things in your head. Like, does this, it's where you go into the situation where I'm sort of thinking about it from the perspective where I go to a lot when I'm listening to arguments is I go into like, is I go into like my Walter Fisher narrative mode is like, does the story this argument is telling make sense? Does it cohere together? So if we go to the example back up in, uh, so go to one of these examples here that we've already talked about, I guess would be one of the ways I would put it. Oh, okay. You want me to put that back up again? Sure. Sure. I like the McDonald's one, but this Toyota one is so weirdly specific. Yeah, let's talk about it. Like, I think I must have been drunk. When I, I love this. it. I love it. Then this is exactly what we're talking about. Or maybe about. I was thinking about a Prius or something. Maybe I was thinking about buying a car. I don't know. Why I don't... would you ever think about buying a car? You hate driving. Well, I don't know how long ago I wrote this. I've been so, teaching for a long right. time, George. All right. Can 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 you read it in your can you read it in your best narrator voice? What year were you born, George? 89. Okay. I was not teaching in 89. No. So I'm not that old. That's good. I was in high school though. No, I'm no, I am not. So I'm not young enough to. I'm I am not young enough to be your, to be your child. So, so good. We're yeah, good. Possibly, barely. Only if you've made some terrible decisions. If I made some bad life choices, for sure. I don't know. Probably good life choices. You're pretty good, George. Thank you. I, I think that would be a good life choice if I ended up with uh, George and be like, yeah, <laughs> you handed me off to Fitzpatrick. My boy is coming up with <laughs> evidence scales on the stream. Yeah, but like. But the whole idea is like, does this do does the evidence fit together in terms of like, does the evidence does the evidence tend to follow the claims that are being made? Does that does it fit the test of fidelity? Does this seem to fit with like what I know about the situation or the mm -hmm. information I'm carrying in yeah. or what I know about the world? I need to find do that. Both of those things fit together. Yeah, the problem I had today was finding the test of evidence chart. They're all from books from like the 1930s and 40s. But so I would say. As far as this question about accept or reject, I think that is the only parlance we have. This yeah. is it true? It's almost like you know um, Jordan Peterson at the Zizek debate being like, "Well, I t my method was I took the Communist Manifesto and I read every paragraph of it, and then I asked myself, is this true?" I'm like, "What kind of method is that? Yeah. It's so weird." Um, but this is supposed to be this is supposed to be some kind of. But we don't really have and then a good I language. My lobster for this. And yeah. then decided. Yeah. We don't really have a good language for this. So what I would say is I think that comfort with um, the swirling eddies of uncertainty, the contextual nature of any judgment has to be a prerequisite for coming up with any kind of um, evidence judgment ability. Because yeah. you say in this context, with this question, this evidence is better than that. And kind of eliminating this kind of overarching idea of facts as kind of cutting through all of the swirling fog and dissipating that fog, which is kind of the fantasy I think a lot of people have about facts. I think it might be a little bit better to say, look, it's unclear what the right decision is. That's the given. It's unclear uh, where people are getting their information. And this, I think, would encourage a little bit more of a critical thinking to say, in this decision I'm trying to make, these are the facts that are relevant. Now, the law handles this really, really well because they have all these statutes and um, things like stare decisis and, and civil procedure and criminal procedure, which show you the way evidence comes in. Right. And they, I they think take they, the they, yeah. they, they systemize it. They take the, yeah. they take the doubt out of people's hands where it's like, no, this is how you have to consider yeah. certain which things. Is why, which is why I always call law baby argumentation. Cause it's like a little baby argumentation. Cause there's not a lot of like, um, it's like building something out of Legos versus Duplo. Like Duplo, nice big bricks that fit together nicely and they're color coded, and you know it works. And the, I'm not saying the law doesn't. I don't function. call it recipe argumentation where you have to explicitly follow the follow the recipe, where there's a lot less judgment in terms of like. Well, it's like you know, it's like if you consider like Velveeta shells and cheese a recipe. Yeah. You can say I do because I'm a terrible cook. <laughs> but I would say that all argumentation is recipe, and then people will be like, "I made it perfectly. Why won't you accept it?" And they're like, "Well, I just don't like Brussels sprouts." And then you're like. Well, then you're a Nazi. That's kind of what we're yeah. right? Because yeah. it's like if you don't accept my ontological positions, 
then it won't matter. I think uh, that's really where we are with the test of evidence is like, if you don't accept my ontological orientation, then there's really no point in me trying to adjust my stuff to you. Like, you know, you're looking at this election tomorrow and it's just very disheartening to see people on the news saying, well, no, we're not. We're just trying to mobilize people to go vote. And you even see former President Obama and former President Clinton saying things like, you know, when um, Democrats turn out and vote, we win. I'm like, well, we win for what? Yeah. We win for what? Like, what's the point of that? Turn out so for what? There's no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, I mean, if I had my soundboard, this would be. This is why Office Turn in the Bin is what? not as cool no. as uh, sound okay. sound dropping. So I think that the binary of accept and reject is a very attractive thing of being like, yeah, that's a fact. That's not a fact. That's so attractive, but facts lose and gain valiance based on the situation in which they apply which is also one of the classical tests of re relevance is one of the classical tests of evidence. This might be true, but is this relevant to this judgment? So it's about, I think it's about our discomfort with uncertainty as a given and our discomfort with um, judgment. And yeah. so the question really becomes how do we make people more comfortable with that swirling inconsistency? I mean, I think um, it's inherently uncomfortable. I don't really know if yeah. there's a way to make people, I was at, I was at Mr. Doc this weekend. Um, oh, yeah. Wasn't that so good? I walked in to, like, what felt like the closest thing to, like, a modern Socratic seminar. Because this guy was on a drunk first date with this girl. And oh, he was no. fighting with the table next to him and the girl he was on the date with about Andrew Tate. Um, and Why did Andrew Tate follow you around? It's kind of scary. It, it, it kind of is. It was funny, though. Um, and I think, like, the discomfort that people have with that shifting nature is, like, the reason that people really love him. Um because he was like, I mean, this is like, this is exactly what we're talking about because he kept saying, you know, like, but this is the truth, right? It's, it's true that this is a feminine quality. You can't argue that this is a feminine quality. And he was having a really hard time when anybody around him and the whole, it's a small restaurant, the whole argument, the whole restaurant was sitting around watching him. And like, there were visible like boos and cheers for points that people were making. Really Wait, you can actually see the boos coming out of people's <laughs> mouth? <laughs> no, no, no. Wait, wait, I was supposed like a Scott Pilgrim, like it was like animated, almost no, like, no, not the like comic no, book style. No. It was visible as in like people God, were not like Dak. people weren't hiding the fact that it was happening. And it was really like everybody was like sort of se like seated around this table that was like perfectly in the middle of this restaurant. Um, as this guy was really trying and failing to make all these like silver bullet arguments by being like, well, this is a fact. This is a fact. Um, and whenever somebody would say like, this is not a fact, he really couldn't, he really couldn't stomach that. Um, and and at a certain point, the, the girl even said to him, like, you know, like, why, like, like, he was talking about how women, women are feminine, and they need to, they need to raise a family. Um, and like, women that choose career over family are so upset, you know, and they, they spend their 40s regretting it. Um, and uh, he, she was like, well, why is it so upsetting to you if that's not true? You know, like, why is it like, why do you, why do you need women to feel bad about not having children? You know, like, what? Why do you need this to be a fact? What is it about this being true that comforts you? Great question. Um, and he had no response to that. Um, yeah, he probably he wouldn't think that was very relevant, right? No, and he didn't. And he was like, yeah. well, if you look at... Look at the data. Rates, he would say, look at the data. And he I did. He was pointing out statistics. Right. And first of all, I was like, where are these statistics from? Mm -hmm. out, of your, out of your whatever. Um, yeah, we all have phones. Why don't we use them to look it up? I think yeah. that would be good. Bentley says, uh, should it be part of the process to discuss the testing each piece? Yeah, I think so. Because clearly the people and I are think that, didn't agree on what was evidence. Yeah, too. I think that that's one of the things that's the problem is we don't have any agreement on proof. Yeah. But that's the natural state of affairs is we don't have that. Until we find ourselves constituted in a position where we're having an argument and we have some agreement about what the proposition is. Um, should women um, stay at home and raise a family? Should women stay out of the workforce? which is a, you know, a terrible proposition, but people debate this kind of stuff all the time. Who am I to say? I wouldn't want to debate it because I find it somewhat undebatable. Yeah. But other people might find it imminently debatable. But um, uh, if you don't have any agreement on that, I, I think a good master class in this is if you, I don't know if it's still up, but I know on YouTube, Hassan uh, Piker debated Andrew Tate about these things before Andrew Tate got canceled. And he, he, a lot of people are saying, well, he did a pretty good job of using the facts. But actually, I think what he's doing, which I think was a little bit more rhetorical, was not just laying him out with facts, but saying, 
how do you explain this information if you're right? So it's more of like this kind of rhetorical thing of saying, mm -hmm. well, if you're right that women are terrible drivers and shouldn't be permitted to drive, how do you deal with this data that young men cause more traffic accidents than, and here's the data, here's what it's from, here's the source, and just kind of watching him spin around it. So I think that it's like that classical debate pedagogy where you'll never convince the other side that you're right. Because in debate, in competitive debate, in school debate, the other side is told to be against you. So they'll never change their mind because that's their role. So if we just treated the world like that, we might find that other people listening might say, oh, or maybe later down the line, the person is like, you know what? Maybe I should rethink that because I really don't have a good response to, to that. But somebody who's convinced they're right has a lot more problems than just uh, um, they probably do know how to look at evidence. They're just choosing not to because they're ideologically charged up, which is another problem. Or, or, or just have become so entrenched in their particular point that they're willing to read the evidence when whatever in whatever way yeah that's all whatever, of us all of us way, do that it's like oh andrew tate would probably say something on the lines of like oh they're probably just distracted by young women when they're behind the wheel it's just it's it's it, or yeah. or or are just being blamed for accidents that aren't really their fault because of bias and insurance or some uh, or some other glib superficial explanation that has nothing to do with what what's actually going on yeah. I mean, I think that one of the frustrating things about these conversations is you launch off into the meta and never come back because yeah. you might be in the meta of like, well, what does it mean for a piece of evidence to be relevant? Or what does it mean for a piece of evidence to be recent enough? But what a horrible experience at such a wonderful restaurant. Actually, it was it was really entertaining because uh, the the entire restaurant seemed to be very event against this guy. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, it was like almost like a community building event because everybody was kind of like when he would say something that was like absurd, everybody would be like, mm. but, you know, I think that there was a part that was sort of what a terrible know, tender date. Huh? That poor woman. No, I feel terrible for her. But she she could have left and she was staying like they brought her another shot and she like slammed it back and oh, wow. stayed there. So I, I think a, a, on a certain level, she was enjoying it. Maybe he was paying for her food. We don't know. Oh, um, probably. Maybe. But like there was, Well, if he's a Andrew Tate person, he's probably like, yep, yeah, got to pay for it. Got to be the a masculine. Got to do the masculine yeah. thing. Uh, but I, mean, it was I don't know if the tests of evidence are evidence themselves. So that's I great. Think, that's an interesting concept. I think you could definitely use them to say, well, this proves that evidence isn't good enough. I mean, this is all a question of comportment, right? Which is what's most interesting to me about this is not whether or not you're right or wrong. I think it's very easy to give students a fallacy quiz. Yeah. Teach them the fallacies, give a fallacy quiz. They make a hundred on the fallacy quiz. Okay, that doesn't empower them on how to use this knowledge in daily life. No, what I like so the question about is, like, is how do you ask the question and how do you how do you make the articulation? What I love to tell them is that the Maybe reason should put why those we teach the fallacies is that they kind of work, right? Like the reason why we teach ad hominem attacks a lot of the time as like a fallacy is because sometimes making fun of the other person actually does persuade like yeah. an audience. But is that an ad hom? Yeah. You sure? It, it is if it's a it directly in response to them like challenging you on a point. It, sure, definitely an ad hoc. Isn't ad hoc always wrong? I mean, wrong. Are we talking about wrong on a moral level? Probably not. There's probably some people out there that you could that you could actually challenge the credibility of and make fun of. I mean, like, yeah, I'm not yeah. I'm not saying I'm not saying every time you I'm not I'm not going to cape up for Ted Cruz and call and saying that calling him Lion Ted isn't exactly the worst thing in the world to do. But like. But what I am saying is, does it follow that that means that you should support this other person or this other person's, you know, campaign? Mm -hmm. No. Like, that's the whole thing here. Like, like, so what I, the, one of the reasons why I talk about it is, yeah, a lot of times if you have like a well-timed joke at someone else's expense, it can make you look more likable. It can make you seem more funny. It can increase your ethos. I mean, so it does like work. From, yeah. Yeah. Yo, Trump ad hommed his way to the White House in 2016, he basically. Because he was, he was, I don't know about that. Well, I think that was part of it. I think he was a very, uh, one way I would describe him is he was a very, um, I compare him sometimes to the Black Eyed Peas, where he has a very um, natural ability to get like certain earworms stuck in your head as a speaker. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as he said, make America great again, like there were, not only did those red hats start selling, there were a bunch of copycat hats, like the, University of Seattle started selling green hats that said make debate great again. And you knew there were a bunch of like copycat memes coming out of it. As soon as he said fake news, people on the left and right started saying it over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Like you just knew he locked into something. Now, is he a particularly disciplined speaker when it comes to staying on topic? No. 
is he good at word economy or like a lot of things where it come, like he'll constantly change subjects in the middle of his speech. The the James Austin Johnson SNL impression illustrates this really well as very stream of consciousness way of speaking. No, there's a lot of things that make him not a very conventionally good public speaker, but he has the ability to be, I think the term I've mimetic, I guess would be the best term yes. for it. He goes viral pretty Evil. easily. Yes. Yeah. And like, certainly probably not worse, probably not the worst speaker to, to hold the office. And that one of his ability, one of his abilities is that occasionally just rip someone at the right time. Like making fun of Marco Rubio worked for him. Making fun of Ted Cruz certainly worked for him. Like make the low of, energy Jeb. Yeah. Yeah. Low energy Jeb Bush, sleepy Joe, like any of mm -hmm. these sorts it's of all things. Good. Yeah. Like it worked. And like that sort of, I don't know about it timing. worked. I mean, we remember all these things, but what do you mean when you say it worked? I think, I, I think it worked in the sense of it kind of put that indelible image for a lot of people, for some people where they kept viewing these people through, through that lens where it did sort of do that damage to their campaign. Maybe yeah. it didn't stop Joe Biden's campaign completely, but like people were definitely noticing, like there was a lot of analysis of like, is Joe Biden really up for like being president? Does he have enough energy to get through the job? That became part of the discourse. So, yeah. I don't know that he caused that, but like it was no, definitely okay. part of it. I mean, I perhaps not true in like the sense of like, you know, this like sterile, you know, universal realness that minds can't tap into. But if you think of truth mm -hmm. as like, a set of conditions that arise that cause a sensation within yeah. somebody that resonates, right? Like the the perfect, you know, amalgamation of, of style and and actual, you know, the actual argument itself, you know, everything coming together and coalescing into this sensation that's caused within the viewer. Mm -hmm. I think that that caused a sensation of truth for people. And I think that that's, I think it's valid to say that that worked, even if you don't necessarily think it's true in the classical sense yeah it's like for me it's like Berkey and identification and division and things like that but i will say i think i think all of the the weird trump phrases worked but not in any kind of persuasive way i think that trump was seen as the person who had the authority and gave permission for people to think and feel terrible things and that's why they went and voted for him <laughs> so i think I mean, it was a, sure i don't think that too. Yeah. i don't think he convinced anybody of anything I think that he was like very much um, so to think of him from the from the idea of like, oh, it was bad information or poor reasoning that got Trump elected. People got tricked. I don't think so at all. I think they were like, oh, yeah, this is who I want to be. I want to be the guy who's rich enough and powerful enough to be able to say, to say what's been really crazy on my mind this whole racist time. stuff yeah. that I can't say because I'll lose my job. So I want to I want to be him. So I'm going to support him. And I think little Marco and low energy Jeb is hilarious as all that stuff said, this is like, um, you know, throwing the finger to the career politicians, professional politicians. Everybody wants to do that um, from different political points of view. So that's what I would say by it worked, but I certainly don't, um, I don't know if Trump belongs in any kind of conversation about um, the kind of things we're talking about, like tests of evidence and reasoning and arguments. No, I wonder about that. I wonder about that because, um, it might be that um, the thing we're missing is that people always reason. What reason is, is identification division, as Burke, I think, kind of nailed it. But I'm kind of a biased Burkean thinker in the way. But there's something else I wanted to say about. How did we get off on that? We were just kind of talking. But what? It's potpourri, we're talking Steve. About so it yeah, happens. We were talking we about do whatever we want. Else. It started with... uh, I can't remember. Do you guys in the chat remember how we got off on that? Because I remember... We were talking about that sliding scale of evidence stuff, which I thought yeah. was kind of cool. Oh, I think it's we always that way. Ad hominem attacks. Oh yeah, analyses. so yeah, so that's the problem. So like ad hominem is a great example. This is what I wanted to say. Ad hominem is a great example of how easy and difficult it is to teach the fallacies at the same time, because first of all, there's absolutely no clear definition of what an ad hominem is, and you look at cases that are not textbook cases, and you'd be like, well. It is kind of true that they make bad decisions or they're not a, a clear thinker. It's kind of true. You know, it's always like a, a, a case by case thing. So, but we teach the fallacies with such a um, oh, iron hand. Yes. Like it's this like yeah. delivered from God, divine, right. unbreakable. And then once somebody makes a fallacy, that's it for them. They're done. It's like so this is the, this is also the Martin Baldry stuff I was talking about at the beginning of the, of the show. Um, Martin Baldry's idea of like silver bullet argumentation is also coupled with this idea of the fallacy fork. Mm 
which is when you encounter fallacy. The fallacy fork? That's yeah, an, that's just an fork. amazing phrase. Yeah. Martin Balgi is a like, really brilliant guy. And uh, the fallacy fork says, um, if you can identify a fallacy, you probably can, and the fallacy is bad, it's probably, you could probably question the, was the argument the fallacy was in persuasive anyway? So you're like identifying this fallacy, but the argument probably, if it's that clear and that egregious, the argument probably didn't have persuasive force. Didn't have a lot of gusto. It's probably not a threatening argument. But when you identify it in an argument that is threatening, it's so complex and everything that it's like, well, I wouldn't want to throw out the entire argument here. Just that's because pretty there's a logical we, gap here. We teach people like it's a buzzer beater. It's like a game show buzzer beater kind of thing. Um. Bentley asks, is it worth thinking about short-term gains versus long-term? A good jab can win a debate by also increasing division. By also increasing division? I think it might mean increasing. I think, um, yeah, I wonder what it means to win a debate. That's a great begged question there. What does it mean to win a debate? So we have um, conventional senses of that scorecard, but you might notice that the presidential debates do not offer any kind of scorecard, any kind of judgment, or any kind of criteria by which the night will go. That's it. They, they don't do that by design because <clears throat> the Commission on Presidential Debates is run by the two parties, and they don't want anyone to be able to say equivocally by a score that somebody lost or won. They want to be able to spin what happened. Because people would stop doing it if they and the, did, for the, sure. And the Commission allows the parties to run wild um, uh, across the debate format and do whatever they want. And it's really kind of horrifying because we all lose out because presidential debates are are really trash because there's no – there are ways that I've tried to work on to make them a little bit more valuable to people. But I think that they're pretty much – we'd be better off without them. You, That's why I'm very, I'm very, very, very um, eager to see what happens with the Republicans <laughs> saying they're not going to do it. Republicans have said that if you're going to be the Republican candidate for president, you cannot appear or participate in a commission-sponsored debate. So that's kind of the end of the commission. If um, Newton Minow and the other founders of the commission, their philosophy has always been like, without full party buy-in, these things are done. So I feel like um, this will be interesting to see what ha what happens if the commission goes ahead. It would be nice for the commission to maybe think about doing what they did in the 19th century when it was considered to be uncouth for an actual candidate presidential candidate debate it was beneath them to go out and debate. They had surrogate debaters go out and do it. Um, big, recognizable figures in the party go out and do the debate. I think that would be great. I mean, like, why, even, why are they supporting the candidate? And I, I think we have surrogate debates very rarely because we're like, we got to hear from the candidates themselves. But it's such a disaster. Like, name a presidential debate that really helped somebody think through the issues better and not just galvanize the views they already had. Um, it really doesn't exist. I mean, the only debate I think that was worth anything just because it was so crazy anarchy and candidates didn't behave in guarded ways because they didn't know what they were doing was the 1992 Richmond debate, which is the very first town hall format presidential debate with Bill Clinton, George H.W. Bush and Ross Perot. So it was also a three way debate. I think it's chaos. Like people are like the journalist hands people the microphone and they're just like grilling George, the president. Like regular yeah. people. They're like, no, 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 that's not the answer. You didn't answer the question. It's really kind of like a relief for people who want that kind of clarity. I think it's a wild debate. Something I really want to um, write about one day, I think. But I want to talk about this idea of increasing division. Increasing division might be a good thing, too. So I don't know what it means to um, win a debate. But maybe one of the focuses of the debate is you want to increase division. That is, you want to show your audience. And this is also something that Perlman and Ulbricht Stitica call um, dissociative argument. Mm. You want to show that the thing that they think that person is, that they identify with, and they are, or that side or that concept, whatever it is, buying a Toyota or voting for Kathy Hochul. Or, is there somebody at the door? No, no, that was, that was, no, that was me. That was, was just you. Me. Okay. Sorry. You can come in, little person. Yes, young student. Okay, I think that weird, I think that weird invitation probably had them run away. But we are in a real live professor's office today, my office. And so there's real live there's, stuff that might happen. Students might come in. Here, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And a student. Yeah. yeah sorry. Point on the, this is so weird. It's hard to it's hard to point when you're looking at yourself backwards in the camera. Have you noticed that? Yeah, a little bit. It's like flipped. I don't know. But um, yeah, it's like a mirror image, I think. So um, yeah, so. Increasing division might be good to say, hey, these are the things that you actually don't value.
I actually think that goes to what you were talking about earlier with people's identification becoming more polarized. Yes. Uh, just because the more evidence you are exposed to, even if your actual views aren't that different, it becomes easier to say, well, I don't, you know, I disagree with, you know, this person identifies as a, as a Democrat and I identify as a Democrat, but I don't believe that. Yeah. So therefore I'm not that. Uh, even if, you know, that's not even necessarily the case. Just to, you, you get into that whole debate of like rhinos and stuff like that. Like, is Liz Cheney really a Republican? Was Tulsi Gabbard really a Democrat before she decided not to be one very recently? Oh. Like, that was a whole, yeah, that was a whole, that was a whole. Her, su her sub stack is out of control. <laughs> I love reading it. It's just out of control. It's like vintage Tulsi. What was so weird is, she, is like, if you go back, even at, outside of foreign policy, if you go back, like, if you go back, like, Two or three years ago, she had some of the most liberal voting records in the history of in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden she's not a Democrat anymore. So well, I think it's like if you're if you're deciding based on think about the things she's deciding based on. That's why it's nonsensical, but she's basing it on being an officer in the military mm -hmm. and caring for the other people in the military and being in the military for her particular ideological reasons that she's talked about, and also being Hawaiian and having that relationship. And also being a woman, you can like chop it up in all these different ways. It's just fantastic. Like she's voting based on these other kinds of like, well, I think this is good for X, Y, Z. And then when you think about it from the party point of view, it doesn't make any sense because she doesn't really follow the party um, conventional wisdom of what she should be doing. Right. So, yeah. Is she a conservative? I mean, it would be wonderful if we had more people voting like that based on, well, here's who I represent. I, I was having a conversation with be someone. much more fun. I yeah, think the, much better government. I, I had a conversation with someone who said, I don't feel like either party represents me anymore. Yeah. And uh, what I told them was, and, and it's, it's like, okay. I, I'm here. You can right. No. It, yes. Yeah. And what I told them was don't <laughs> like, so this was you draw. No, no, no. it could have been draw, draw like all the only advice I can give you is figure out what you, what you would find unacceptable if the government did, and vote for whatever candidate you think is least likely to do the most of those things. And that is a hard thing to say that we are at that point, but like, no, I think that's the way voting works, right? Yeah. Isn't it like, like if you look at the, if you look at the federalist papers, it's like, why would the national government work? Well, you would vote for people who are beyond petty disagreements. So they would only, they would be well-educated men, like emphasis on men who uh, would be beyond these sort of petty disagreements that you get in state legislatures so they would check back the kind of corruption you have in the state i mean they weren't the founders weren't exactly right about that we can we can be kind of sad they say not all founders they weren't a hundred percent right about it but um it is kind of an interesting idea that they thought that the national government would cut through all that stuff the reason why is because they thought that every there wouldn't be parties there would just each state would represent its state interests and it would be easy to kind of see that kind of um Gabbardism, that kind of like, oh, well, this is because you're representing this very, you very group Hawaiian of, yeah, style, yeah. the Hawaiian military point of view, um, or the, the military soldier point of view from the Midwest is probably quite a bit different, but maybe not. I, don't, I wouldn't know, but that kind of representative difference Duckworth. would be a lot of fun, I think. We can ask Tammy Duckworth, I guess. Let's get her on the phone, yeah. Go, George. Where's your phone? Okay, there we go. Are you really calling somebody's extension? It looks like you are. You better hang up. <laughs> I wonder who I wonder who you called. Watch the it be the provost. Yeah. The university president. How'd you get Mr. the Chairman unlisted Chairman. provost hotline? Yeah. <laughs> you have you have called the provost hotline. It's like when the cold caller people if you are a student, press FBI. one. <laughs> Para Espanol, marque numero dos. <laughs> yeah, very good. We all have that memorized whether we speak Spanish or not. You're better than me, then. Yeah, okay. There's a couple different ways to say it. Sometimes it's open in the world, though. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah oh, my goodness. Why am I yawning so much? Oh, I can tell you. Daylight savings time. The last one ever, right? I hope. No, no, no. It'll be permanent as opposed to the other way around. Yeah, like, I thought, like, this is the last time we're doing it. Right? Like, we're not. We're never changing the clocks again. I don't know if they passed that. I don't, they? Know. I don't know. It's Yes, I, we, no. We're, they, they, they were go, there was a plan to pass permanent daylight savings time. You know, th this maybe I was the fool. Maybe I didn't do the thing where I, I asked for evidence, and somebody I trusted just told me it was the last one ever. And I just, oh, and you should see. That's another interesting thing about the test of evidence is there are times when they're warranted, but if you went around doing it to everything, everything you heard, 
it would slow. Maybe that's the kind of world we would want to live in where every decision thinking is very slow and everybody is really weighing it in. But sometimes the stakes are low. So you kind of take on face value the evidence that people are giving you. That cowboy song um, would play in your head the entire time, like wow, 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 and you'd be like, and you'd be like sweating, like walking through the field of evidence all the time. Oh wow! Could be even Jeopardy music. Yeah, right. No, yeah, could but, be Jeopardy music. I mean, yeah. So what is even? I don't know. Sometimes you end up in discussions where you're you're not even thinking about that, and then you realize later, oh, I just agreed to a lot of things maybe I shouldn't have agreed. Yeah, that happens quite a bit. I remember teaching propaganda and public speaking years ago. And I was like, what did you guys think about this propaganda reading? You know how I do that at the beginning of every class. I'm like, what did you guys think? Let's so start there. And somebody was like, I think I have believed a lot of things I shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa, okay. The lucidity. Yeah, right. hard hitting t- yeah. pr- personal testimony. This out, person just out gave about. sentience. Yeah, I, yeah. They're just like, oh my God, I, I believed a lot of things in my life that I should not have believed. And I was like, okay, that's pretty good. But it also is like, um, they're so powerful. The fallacies and tests of evidence are so powerful. They might lead us into a kind of a comfort that's also equally as dangerous as being ignorant to how people can trick us with language or trick us with nice sounding stuff or try to expand their authority beyond its um, appropriate scope and limits, this kind of thing. So I don't know. I mean, that, that happens all the time. You, you meet people that are absolutely convinced they can't get like dogged in a deal and then they, they overpay by like, Twenty thousand yeah. dollars for a used car, like, or you know, fifteen million dollars, fifteen billion dollars for you know a social media website that never yeah. makes any money. Failing Bluebird website, yeah. Rip Twitter, it was fun though. Yeah, I think it's still going to be around. All my, I, mean, I don't know. We can talk about Twitter. I was going to talk about Twitter on the stream as well. But we can talk about arguments about Twitter too. Yeah. One of the things that I think is interesting about Twitter is it's a great example of the way you phrase a debate changes the kind of evidence that you would want and changes what kind of facts you would want in that so um i don't know should we dare to try to use the board do it oh. i mean well, we, it's in the it? shot i don't know will it be glary I feel like you could what do you think chat that. should we try the board we'll you can put it thinks. on the board yes what's that from that's a um that's a baseball commentator's race that's oh. paul carlson oh, okay. from the chicago white sox Today Yep. Yeah. TIL. Baseball's yeah. over, by the way. Congrats, Astros. Yes. Everyone, throw your garbage cans up in the air to celebrate the Houston Astros oh, winning the garbage cans. And then um, the really city of Houston, the city of Houston canceled all schools so that they could have a uh, parade today, which is, is exactly Did what's really? wrong with America. So. Did it really? mm-hmm. so what's wrong with this country is like, oh, a professional sports team won. Oh, no God. learning today. I, I need to no show. I today. need to show you what I, I need to sh- send you a clip of. Uh, some live television from the Houston area immediately after they won the World Series. Oh, God. Do I want to see it? Mattress Mac made $75 million or something. Mattress Mac. Yeah, he bet, on, he, bet on the, uh, he bet on the Astros to win the World Series yep. and, and at like plus, at combined plus 750. Yeah. Way, way, way back when. He put $10 million on it. Yeah, he put $10 million in a bunch of different books and it averaged out to plus seven. For those of you who don't know who Mattress Mac is, Mattress Mac is a Houston institution gallery furniture owner and operator mattress mac yeah, was not um the hero that we all really need he i mean he, apparently he actually did a lot for i want to say like hurricane ian relief as well oh. was so, that the big one what was the name of the big houston hurricane he did a lot oh no irma, irma is the, irma? the big one there but he's so done the big he's one done a bunch wiped, of different kind stuff. of wiped houston out He's done. He's done a bunch of different stuff. Let's get Mattress Mac up here on the screen. Got, I mean, among. Uh, I mean, among. Uh, I mean, among local like uh, local people, he is apparently. Oh, he actually has a real name, and it's not Mac. It's Mackinvale. Jim Mackinvale. Mackinvale. That's that? what. Oh, I thought yeah. Mac would have been like his first name. Yeah, me too. Hmm. Yeah, Gallery Furniture is a weird place, but good job, Mattress Mac. I'm glad you won millions of dollars. Congrats. Well done. I'm hoping to win the Powerball tonight um, myself. Oh, I got to buy tickets. I bought my Powerball tickets on the app, but I feel like the oh, app. Oh, there's an like, app now? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Just like how you can do the sports betting on your phone, you can play the lottery on your phone. No, it's very dangerous for me. For yeah, oh, It's a lot of fun to play the lottery yeah. on your phone. Though. Uh, no, but I do have that in my family, so I'm not. Uh, oh, yeah. You want to be careful with that. You got to be careful with that. 
Uh, I would say so. Um, I restrict myself to only playing the lotteries if the jackpot goes over a billion dollars. That is my that's that a is good my restriction. Line. It's only happened a couple of times in the past couple of years. So exactly. So it keeps me. It keeps me. It, it keeps me grounded. One yeah. day you'll have to adjust for inflation. All right. While that's we true. wait on the chat to say, should we try to use the whiteboard? No, it says not? use the board. Use the board. Use the board. Yeah, Bentley is starting the chant. I don't know if you guys are watching on YouTube. Uh, Bentley is watching over on Twitch. Yeah, there we go. There's a that's a that's a endorsement. Oh, I trust Bentley. retweet does not equal endorsement, Steve. It does retweets, uh, absolutely equal endorsement. Why else would I be retweeting? Them? I mean, people say retweet to me, like, you know, like, amen. Yeah, but if I'm retweeting, can I get an amen? Yeah, but like, what I want to know is like, how could I look at a, someone retweeting something and be like, oh, they obviously are not endorsing that. It doesn't make any sense to me. So I don't understand. What I put, uh, people put this in their Twitter bio, and I think it was probably some like boomer style email thing where it was like, you're going to get sued if you don't put this in there. Or, or make sure or, you or put like a copy statement. Paste, or like yeah. the copy paste to keep yeah. like the rights to your photos yeah, on Facebook exactly. that absolutely yeah. does not That's work. what I was about to say. Yeah. That's what I was about to say. And so I just put in my Twitter bio, I put um, my opinion, my tweets should be your opinions too. Because why else would I be tweeting? I'm trying to convince you to think a certain way. Why else would I be doing it? I'm trying to change the nature of your perception of reality through my arguments. Why else would I be tweeting? What's the what is the point of Twitter and why would Elon Musk want what to What is pay? the point of Twitter is a great yeah. existential But question. why would someone like Elon Musk, who has obvious um, fringe political beliefs, want to be in charge of something like that? It doesn't take a, a genius to Obviously, say, well, this is Chelsea Manning. If you want to this get invitational, a, yeah. that's, Twitter's the ultimate act of violence. Hey, yeah. violence. I mean, I think Twitter is the kind of argumentation that uh, invitational rhetoric is so, Sony trying to argue against. So, so, sorry. Oh, welcome, <laughs> Sonia. Well, welcome, Sonia in disguise. Oh, God. Take off the mask. Was, Take off the mask. Sorry, I was an undergraduate for Halloween. That's scary. Oh, that's a good, yeah, that's a good costume. You just, unfortunately, I haven't figured out how to take it off yet. No, no. Okay. Maybe I never will. Maybe I'll do something. I don't know. Okay. So, yeah, so gallery furniture weird weird place mattress max so if you work at gallery furniture this is all what i've heard if you're from houston or houston area or you're a mattress mac fan please chime in but uh if you work at gallery furniture you have to go to this like christian camp it's christian. where Ma yeah, mattress mac is a big time protestant christian faith he has all these sayings wow. about jesus and stuff that you have to learn and these are the principles by which gallery furniture operates okay. and you kind of have to buy into this kind of christian Neo Jesus ideology to work at Gallery Furniture, but also Gallery Furniture has free snacks mm -hmm. <clears throat> and an aquarium and a zoo huh? at the furniture store. I'm not kidding. Huh. Wait, so he's basically <clears throat> like wow, my John, my sister who lives in my sister who lives in Houston called the Gallery Furniture. She lives in Katy, Texas, right outside of Houston. It's called the Katy Zoo. But to his credit. Gallery Furniture, Mattress Mac, when people like Joel Osteen, who are in-your-face Christian ministers, Protestant ministers, closed and locked their church and wouldn't let people use it as a shelter, even though it's a former basketball arena, Mattress Mac opened up all his stores and said, come and live in my furniture showroom Wow! Uh, during the hurricane. If you have nowhere else to go, we'll use the we'll use this as a shelter. So and, yeah, uh, I mean, let's see if we can get It does some... sound like a Christian version of Bob's Discount Furniture, who is a known Connecticut institution, Connecticut, New York institution. Wait, look, yeah. Wait, is Bob's only Connecticut, New York? Is that not yeah. Nationwide? Yeah, he's not nationwide. Uh, I thought he was. Full let's see. No, I, have, I have met Mr. Kaufman before. Bob Kaufman is uh, very gangly. Nice oh. guy, though. The, the clay doll of him on TV looks is is, is, is so, on, uh, honestly a, a, a accuracy yeah. accuracy. No, but that's that's cool. I like that he's at least true to the values, you know. No, well, like at least it's, practice it's really, your Christian. If you're yeah, gonna preach Christianity, at least practice it. That's awesome. It's nice. It's not funding like. Uh, well, you know, it's like he's doing the right thing, and I wonder you could also be cynical and say, "Well, it's a business decision or whatever." But yeah, but he. I mean, businesses don't hey, have look, to... Hey, look, I would rather someone do the right thing for the wrong reasons than the wrong thing for, you know, than just the wrong thing yeah, for any right. reason. Yeah. Apparently, even also... He, even if he's taking in people from Hurricane Irma as a tax write-off, like, yeah. that's still good. I think he probably had to write that stuff off. I bet yeah. it was all yeah. trash. Uh, probably. In that hurricane awesome. waters. Like, good for you. Yeah. Like, if that's if you're still outperforming Joel, o Joel, like, Joel Osteen's megachurch, like, 
I, good for you that you just won the lottery. Though I like, can't imagine sleeping with the pilots would be the most enjoyable thing. <laughs> yeah, here's, here's some of the weird animals. It's like it's kind of like a zoo. They have monkeys there. Wow. They have a giant aquarium. I mean, I guess it's so strange. That's the lost. That's the it's lost. So scene. strange. I guess it is. You it's you just pay for yeah. the animals, and then people come in and look at your furniture, and then they think, "Huh, maybe I yeah. do need a new couch." Or, or, or it's like, I, you know what? You know what? I bet that's designed to do. I bet that's a way to say, like, "Oh." I don't want to go furniture shopping and like bring my kids, but like it's an easy way to distract your kids. Like, oh, the animals are here. That's something for them to look at. They won't bother me. Consistent with the family. Yeah. The other thing that's great about Mattress Mac is he ran into a, a Phillies fan at the Astros game before, before the final game, and, and then he launched into an expletive riddled tirade against this oh, weird Phillies fan. Wrong. And uh, <laughs> people in Houston were like, even though he's like this uh, um, Christian guy, here's the stuff about the. Um, during the cold weather, he had a warming center. He's like, come in and get warm. You can sleep on the beds. I have blankets oh. and stuff. So he's like very charitable guy. But yeah. then he also attacked this Philly fan with a, he was this rude Philly fan and Not just me. chewed him out, cussed him out. And then they started making uh, t-shirts, Mattress Mac. T don't mess with Mac. Like don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Mac. And good for you. Good, shirts, good for you, Mattress so Mac. Funny. Which are very funny, this kind of thing. But all this stuff just goes to show about the prevalence of identification and, and persuasion and yeah. an argument and how people are like, yep, I want to wear a t-shirt that has Mattress Max face on it that says, don't mess with Mac I, because I want to show I'm on the side of this thing. Among the Houston area oligarchs, he appears to be one of the better ones mm -hmm. that I'm hearing about. And I love going to gallery furniture because you get like your little soft serve and your popcorn. You look at the birds, sounds you look like at the monkeys. Idea. Yeah, he does sound a lot like Bob. It's like a, it's it, a, it sounds exactly like Bob's discount furniture. They also yeah. have popcorn maker. Yeah. Well, it's much better than I think Bob's or Ikea because it has a zoo and a huge aquarium. So there's no aquarium. zoo, but like the rest of the stuff you're saying, like the free food and things mm -hmm. like that, there's like a food area and, and, and yeah. yeah. Ikea is probably the most Ikea is so Scandinavian. Yeah. It's a wonder it survives in this country. I've I love Ikea. Oh, the Ikea is closing in Rego Center, the one in Queens. Oh. It's oh. in December it'll close. Isn't that sad? That is I just learned that the other day. I'll go there and I will single handedly yeah. save the business. We got to go there and eat Swedish meatballs every day to keep them open. Sure. Someone's got to make the sacrifices. And, keep and keep, the keep them open by closing your arteries. That's, That's right. Day. Eat them meatballs, son. I kind of want to go to Mr. Dak now, but I went out to dinner last night to celebrate National Nacho Day. Mm -hmm. So I ate a big plate of nachos, even though I'm not supposed to. Can I give chips. a birthday? Can I give a birthday shout out on the mm -hmm. podcast? Sure. At midnight, happy birthday, Sophia Zinger, who is turning 33. Whoa! Okay. I'm going to her trivia night tonight. So. Oh, is this the, the event you went for? The yes. Other day? Yes. Oh. Someone's been checking my Instagram stories. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's S O F, but it's fine. We're good. Hmm. S O F I A. Oh, weird. Wonder why it's an F. It's be she's um she's of Uruguayan descent. So. Oh, okay. Is that does that explain that? Yes. How so? That's how you spell it in, like. I have seen people um, from, like, South America spell their name S-O-F-I-A. Yes. I've known a couple of Hispanic Sophias. There you go. I think Sophia in um, the capital of, what's the capital of, Sophia is the capital of what, Romania? Uh, Bulgaria. Bulgaria. Capital Bulgaria, Sophia. I think it's spelled like this, too. Yes, it is. S-O-F-I-A. Okay. Well, happy birthday, Sophia. There you go. There's your shout out. From George. For a brief little bit, I used that as an online pseudonym. Yeah. Sophia. Sophia. Yeah. It's a good one. But yeah, but back to Twitter. Um, I was going to write out on the board. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe we can just talk about it. Like how you can have. And if you're thinking about how to bring these things in when you're teaching, which I think is interesting to think about current events, how to bring them in. One of the ways of doing it is to try to set up the discussion topic like it would be a debate topic. So. There's several different levels of the Twitter scandal that you could use. So you can say Elon Musk should not run Twitter. That's one level. And you can think automatically populate what the arguments might be and why those arguments might be persuasive to different people and how you'd make that case. And then the second one would be something like, what did I come up with in my class? I should have written it down because it was pretty good. It was like kind of spur of the moment thing. But it was like um, uh Wealthy billionaires should not run social media accounts. Now, that's a very different kind of 
Quain. Right. Yeah. But you can still talk about Elon within that as a subset. And then the most broad one that I could come up with was um, social media is too important to be individually owned. Mm. Right. And that one would bring up all the different, like, not only shouldn't Elon do it, but eccentric, wealthy people should not be allowed to use their money to purchase things that are so incredibly important to the public. Or even, or even if, trust, or even if we found really a non-eccentric, wealthy person, maybe we shouldn't trust them either. Even yeah, nobody should Mac. own this stuff. Mattress Mac should not own. Is there, is there a person that's good enough to own a public forum? Yeah, Gallery Furniture is like a great charity, apparently. So, I don't know. so I've been there many times. I, I never bought anything from Mattress Mac, but it's a nice place to go. I, I this always raises the other question for me, where we start to think of these institutions on social media as they've started to become sources where people get their news, even if they're not directly providing it. People are getting it through these sites, and how like it's a big thing for Facebook exactly. and how to combat the things. I I mean, it, whether it's a good thing or not, I think it's an is yes. at, at this point. Yeah. Um. And that's where I sort of had a discussion with my students about how how the the limits of the how the limits of the medium itself, and you know, the medium being the message, old old Marshall McLuhan coming back to haunt us yet again, Boys. has created. He never I left think, in my world. Always, I think has created a Marshall's world we're all living in. I think created sometimes creates like these interesting distortions where half truths become very prevalent because of the time constraints that get put on the medium and i think a really good example of this and i don't i don't know the name of the creator in this case but there was a creator talking about how characters are often coded with disabilities to show that they are villains in media and this is a really good like presentation like oftentimes Characters have like burns on their face or are placed in a wheelchair or have like some sort of physical disability to show that they're evil. Essentially, it's a shortcut to show that they're evil. They're coded this way. And the statement was made at the end of the TikTok that being being disabled was criminalized in the United States until 1973 in public. Mm -hmm. Now, this statement is not completely true. There is, there were some laws in some major U.S. cities that were specifically target at, targeted at people with disabilities, and they were related specifically to, um, I don't know what the term, busking or panhandling, and they were in place from about the middle of the 1960s to 1973, where a lot of these were repealed. Now, and this came up in a lot of discussions about whether or not this fact was true, and it was this specific, these specific laws were cited. Now, obviously the statement isn't completely untrue, but it's also a very gross overstatement of the reality here. So that's the tough part that you get into. And I think that when you're limited to 280 characters or you're limited to a minute of videos that are being constantly scrolled through and when the internet in general is being designed to give you more of what you already like, or at least more of what you already watch, that these sort of half truths are become are are something that we really need to watch out for. Mm -hmm. Where statements that are not completely falsifiable or aren't completely invalid or completely without evidence, but that do not completely cohere with the reality of the situation. Like, is it true that like? there were things that, that laws specifically targeted people with disabilities in the United States up until 1973. Yes. Does that mean that people with disabilities in the United States could not go out in public until 1973? That's not a fair characterization of the reality on the ground. And that, and that to do that at the end of a video that actually provided some great contextualization for how coding disabilities toward like villainy happens a lot in media it's like really unfortunate that i think that this is a very like that this is kind of endemic to a lot of the discourse that goes on where certain pieces of information can get decontextualized or or distorted enough in a way that or sensationalized enough that they get taken into a way that like can allow for this overstate, can allow for this overstatement, can allow for these sorts of things because the medium encourages this because of the restrictions that are placed on it. And it, it just shows you that like, when we rely on micro blogs like Twitter or like micro video sites like TikTok, 
or photo sharing sites like Instagram as like a just source of news. It shows you how ill-equipped they are to deal with nuance, to deal with any sort of ability to make a nuance point for something like this. And yes, there are probably creators that can manage to do this, but I think we have to really have a conversation about what mediums are we going to if we want, what sources of media are we going to if we actually want to have a conversation about a particular topic that is representative of the overall of the overall thing. And there's there's other distortions that come out of this. There was a large spread conspiracy theory that was going around TikTok about Helen Keller not actually yes. being blind and actually not being not blind. actually existing. But yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's fake. She's a she's a created. She's a psyop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A psy she's a created creature for propaganda. Right. What the, propaganda? I don't know. Government propaganda. Or or another education or, works. Or, or, yeah. or and I had another student come up to me talk about that there was this. I would say I would about. say well I would say to the stuff you already talked about before you start getting into all yeah. the numerous thousands of specifics, the Hearst newspapers and remember the Maine and all that. Same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, the yellow yellow journalism. I mean, newspapers newspaper. have the same problem. This is what McLuhan would say. He's like, look, the medium is the message, which means there's not better and worse media. The media will determine what information it um, sends out. So everything is already kind of in a in a different kind of a... So he used the metaphor of the whirlpool. He used the, um, or what's it called? The um, maelstrom, that Edgar Allan Poe story. So uh, what Marshall McLuhan always say is like the story of the maelstrom from Edgar Allan Poe is a story of a sailor in a boat getting caught in the maelstrom. And he thinks, oh, yeah, I, you know, we're being sucked to the bottom of the sea. I need to find something to float onto. And what he noticed as he looked around on the boat, because he stayed on the boat, other people jumped off, and, is that some things were being pulled to the bottom that he thought would float. But maybe heavier things would be brought to the top and be rescued. So he tied himself to the heaviest chest he could find on the boat. And he floated to the surface and was rescued. And this is like an Edgar Allan Poe tale, but um, Marshall McLuhan, who had a literature background, he wasn't a media scholar because that didn't exist when he was in school. He said, this is the way that we should think about our media environment, is the things and the way that we think things would work intuitively or rationally or the way that we, we believe logic and reason to work or support to work in a mediated environment is not going to be intuitive. It's going to be, it's going to require us to critically ascertain the swirling environment around us, which is going to be hard to do, very hard to do, because we're going to be panicked. We're going to be feel like we're being pulled to the bottom. And I, so many people I know are in this situation, right? Yeah. They look at, they're like, oh my God, they're desperate for Fox News or they're desperate for um, Trevor Noah or um, what's his name? John, um, Oliver. John Stewart or John Oliver. They're desperate for them. Oh, to lash themselves that, yeah. to those people in order to help pull them out of the, where our country's collapsing. We need to tie ourselves to these people to, to bring us and float us up. But these people are not, um, you know, it's not going to work that way. It's always going to require critical thinking, even on the people you love, right. even on the people who have the positions you have. So it's, for me, it's none not. Of the people you named are journalists. They're comedian. Like John Oliver is a comedian. John Stewart is a comedian. Like And not to draw like an explicit line between those things, but they're not. They always have the out to say that I'm making jokes about this particular subject and can have an out in their credibility or the same way that Joe Rogan can say, I am just having interesting people on. I'm just asking questions. There's always these we're always almost on like a search for like the Walter Cronkite, like the voice of America that we can always trust. And like, we don't have like like we don't have like a Peter Jennings or like who was the last one, Peter Jennings or Brian Williams before we found out he wasn't in a helicopter. Like, like no one that we can go to and like who has that level of credibility to talk about these particular things. I mean, even, I mean, your, your point like proves itself. Even exactly. The even the journalists aren't trustworthy. So right. what's the point of who cares if they're not journalists? I don't see the point of that. The point is that we identify with them. So um, Trevor Noah, we identify with Trevor Noah. We want to be like him. We want him to be our friend. But this is also the 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 way that um, uh, television changes the um, the role of the journalists. Right? There's lots of writing about that. McLuhan kind of started all that too. But the reason why I think the reason why I bring this up is like I don't care necessarily that they're not journalists from the perspective of like yes we can identify with people that aren't journalists. I care from the perspective of when they make a mistake or when they present misinformation or when they 
present something out of context. They always have the out of saying that it could be for the purposes of a joke or that the show is for the purposes of entertainment, not necessarily. But what if we took the perspective that it's all misinformation? All of it, all the time. Yeah. I mean, I loved taking a stats class. Like, I feel like nothing has been as orienting to me in terms of like sifting through information as like taking stat in high school. Um, Cause like, the amount of times that you come across something that, you know, like, because all it did was give me, like, you know, a key number of, like, terms that I kind of now like to look for that I, you know, sometimes I'll see it and I'll be like, ah, this feels off, you know, like, I feel like, like, for example, like, people will be like, oh, a recent study, and I'm like, that sounds weird. What's the sample size? And then you look at it and it's and like what 25. Is recent, and what is recent? Or yeah, chaos. and it's like yeah. 10 years ago. And, like, you know, like, I, I think that, not that, you need stats to necessarily like ascertain like what's true. And what's it's not. a really helpful you need, class. You need evidence. I've always thought that like one of the best things that, because I, and I ask myself this all the time, like if I could do one thing for the country, what would it ever be? And it was like making a mandatory information literacy course in every high school in America. And I'm like, but what would that look like? And, and I think, like? I think for the, we've been talking for almost two hours and I think we're, we, I think it know. would be a lot like this. I think it would be like a Socratic seminar, so Socratic seminar, like open discussion, town hall, like yeah. talk about it, give a topic, see what we want to talk about and kind of center it around a couple principles. But even that, like, even that doesn't really work. Right. It, it falls into anarchy so fast. Right. No, and there'd be a lot of discomfort around this. There'd yeah. be a lot of discomfort around the idea. Like, and there wouldn't be a lot of agreement on, on some things, certainly. <clears throat> yeah, I think that a really important book that if you're interested in this topic, a really important book to read is David Bohm's On Dialogue. I think this is like a masterwork of this kind of thing of like, what would this look like? Not information literacy, because information literacy has a lot of assumptions I don't agree with. One, that is also true. there's information and noise, right? And I think there's that great book, Information, A History of Theory of Flood by Gleick. Gleick, maybe? Is that the guy's name? I should really be putting some of these things up on the screen um, for you folks who are who are taking a look for you people, you fine folk who are sticking with us through the, uh, this is actually oh my God, a, pretty, it's got a fork on it. pretty cool conversation. So, um, the first one I'll show. Wow. Is that the fallacy fork? It must be. Got the fallacy fork right on the cover. Oh yeah. The Rootledge editions have, have like, so Bohm wrote a lot of, um, I'm going to show this even though it's like a, a company, but it's not Amazon, so I feel okay showing David it. So eight dollars for David Bohm. Boom. So David Bohm is an interesting character. I don't know if you might know who he is, oh chat, but he won the um, excuse me, he won the um, Nobel Prize for Physics for his work on optics. He's oh, one of the inventor of the laser. And he he was a big laser researcher <laughs> in optics, and so. When he won that, he thought, maybe I could contribute with my new platform. I could contribute something to, uh... oh, I love how there's still a path button here. You guys remember path? Oh, no, wait, that's, that's Pinterest. Pinterest. Sorry. I Sorry. thought it was path. I missed that old that old social media site. But anyway. Not as much as you miss Google+. Plus. Oh, God, I love Google+, Plus so much. I miss it. That was such a great one-stop, one-stop shopping. So David Bohm wrote this book on dialogue where he's basically doing, so information literacy, I promise you, information versus noise that information could be read and it can be read in an appropriate and correct way, like a grammar of information. I just think all these things are up for debate and are all part of the meta that drives people crazy about why argument and debate should be avoided and people should just shut up and do what the experts tell them. Cause uh, we like that kind of comfort and speed. We like the speed of information like the speed of facts. We like the speed of the, of um, this kind of enlightenment style, neoliberal enlightenment style um, thinking and reason. We like the speed of that. It's just such a bad way to think. But on dialogue kind of gives us shortcuts and provides us new maps of that by saying, well, we should do these dialogues on topics that interest people and everybody can come to the dialogue and um, talk about nothing, really. Just kind of talk about what's on their mind and then ask about, well, why do you feel that way? What are the things that support you to feel that way? So this book is great because it outlines what proper dialogue is in Bohm's estimation. And I feel like it's one of the best theories out there. And then uh, what else did I have? I had that information. Yeah, information history theory flood. James Gleick. I think that's how you say his name. 
Gleick, I would say, maybe Gleek, I don't know. But the information, a history of theory of flood. Great to talk about like that, um, that old distinguishing sense of information versus noise now is uh, we're so high tuned and it's so atomized that we're just overwhelmed with information, information, information. But it's been that way for a while. And it also goes back to early modern period. There's another great book everybody should read. Um, gosh, what is the name of that book? I can see the cover in my head. Uh, this is a problem I have where I can't remember the title. Well, anyway, there's another great book. I can put it in the um, in the notes later of a book where um, it talks about the transition from the way you were a knowledgeable person is you had read all the books in the world on botany, which is easy to do when there's only eight. Uh, it's just hard to find them because they're expensive and it's hard to get them because the mail isn't very good. So you have to sail to another continent or take a wagon to another continent or another country and go and look at somebody's library if they will let you look at it, which is crazy. So um, then that changed from when there were so many books that you couldn't even really keep track of all the new books coming out. How do you determine someone's knowledgeable? And that's where the PhD was invented. The PhD was like, well, they can write their own book that shows that they've referenced. They can make their own argument. That could be a published book. And that's how the PhD was born. So lots of different ways of, of governing all this stuff. I think instead of um, information literacy, maybe we need um, comfort with disorientation, maybe, or not really, what would you call it? Literacy of the fog. I don't know what you would call it. There's got to be a good metaphor out there. There's got to be a miasma good Miasma is a good, is a good word. The miasma, I, I comfort think in the miasma. Maybe we should think of it as like, if, if we're concerned about combating misinformation, then maybe one thing that we would want think it, it that we would want to think is if we want people avoiding confirmation bias, then maybe we need to think of it as like creating information economy. Like how do we streamline certain things to get to present information that we want people to see as efficiently as we possibly can? Like we we even talked about with public speaking, like word economy, time economy is a very important thing that having a very well organized presentation of like two to three main points with like a clear introduction and conclusion is extremely important to making sure that they retain the roughly five to nine pieces of information that anyone is going to retain from any particular piece of media. So maybe we need to start thinking of it this way, that just flooding people with more information to combat misinformation is the wrong way of doing it, that it's a matter of thinking about it from the perspective of how do I show people the information that I think that they need to see about a topic as efficiently as they can, recognizing that I do not want to contribute to their overload and push them back cognitively as much as possible. And that's a hard thing to deal with. And maybe we're mm -hmm. already, maybe that's too naive a way to thinking. Maybe the internet has opened that Pandora's box of that we will, we just have to permanently function in a world of information overload now. And we just have to accept the fact that cognitively that's where we are. But I think that if cognitive, that information overload is leading to these cognitive biases and those cognitive biases just mean that we're getting more entrenched, then that means that we're in a world where our persuasion is just a world of maintenance, where it's getting people out to vote, where it's getting people to donate for you, where it's the DNC sending you those emails begging for another $20. And it's not a world where we view the other side or people that even are not too far apart from you is all that convincible where we view them as like obstacles or view people who are really far apart from you as evil. Yeah. So I think that that's something that we need to consider that if that's what we need to combat, like constantly constantly like activating people's confirmation bias because of this information overload, then we need to have like sort of a information economy and the way things are presented, where we're presenting, where we're taking much care, much more careful consideration of presenting information much more carefully and consistently and judiciously with a compelling narrative reason to go with it. And, and hoping that that pushes the realm as opposed to just throwing fact checks and throwing more information in people and hoping that it just floods out the bad quote unquote bad information from the market Ooh. you know what this is reminding me of i don't know if you oh, i forget who wrote it thinking fast and slow ah oh, daniel, daniel kahneman yeah and i don't i don't love him but like oh i do but you you were referring to economy of time and you know this reminds me of the system a system b thinking yep. thinking fast and slow 
or like maybe the answer isn't to always be comfortable in disorientation or to always look for an immediate system of thought but to develop both of these things separately and like develop I'm doing the thing develop a sense of discernment when should i be in system a when should i be in system b um or more it's like how do i make sure that system a doesn't run away yeah with system B think uh, when system B thinking could provide a different context here. We're in a different context here. Cause like, as we were talking, you were like, you know, like maybe we should get comfortable with the uh, disorientation. The miasma, yeah. Yeah. Course, and you yeah. were like, maybe we should, you know, economize. And I was like, I was thinking to myself, um, you know, like it's, it's useful in leisure um, to, to sit down and think. Um, but sometimes I, I think oftentimes what, how would I talk about this to my mother? Because my mother is like that's great. That's a great mother. exercise. I think it's a um, wonderful exercise. You know, like what would what yeah. would be something that my mother would want to hear? This but like, isn't that the? I mean, isn't that the point of all of this education? Is like, so go talk to the public, so we can go talk to the people we encounter in life and say, "Here's how you ought to be thinking." Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole point of all of this. It's not to like yeah. hold it above everyone's head and say, "Oh, look at the dumb people." Yeah. Right. This is like part of my um, beef with intercollegiate debate too. It's just like, "Oh, look at the stupid people who don't know how to debate." <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, you only know how to debate at these weekend warrior things yeah. that are like so. That's ridiculous. that's my pinky out being all hoity toity. Wait, yeah. we didn't get. I saw Daniel Kahneman up here. We didn't get the pinky out. How do you? How do you what convince is this? your uh, mother? Yeah, I yeah. think that having publics and thinking about how to speak to publics about it's very important. So that's an important point. That's I think there's like that's a great exercise. Maybe that can be added to the critical thinking exercises. How do I communicate this to my parents? Because everyone thinks their parents are stupid, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, and I sadly, that means stupid. your parents think that your grandparents were stupid at some point. Is that wild? Yeah, but yeah. That's the way that's the way kids are with their parents. If you're a parent, you can verify that in the chat. Do your children think you're stupid? As uh as the greatest philosopher of our time once said, these DJ Jazzy Jeff, parents just don't understand. I think that was famous slapper. He slaps, the song still slaps. Will oh. Smith. They're, oh, they're, they're in conjunction with the uh, he he sla yeah. that song slapped and he's still slapping to this day. Do we need to put a picture of Will Smith up? That that gave me so much cognitive whiplash because you were like slapper and I was like, does yeah. he mean physically? And then I thought you meant metaphorically. It slaps. And then I knew you meant. Yeah, I was I was wow. schooled by my classes that I can't say that rhetoric is a bop or that rhetoric slaps because these refer to music, so you can't say I that. Do but I think you could. I don't know. I think that's too strict of an interpretation. I, mean, I agree. Many people say many know. things slap. Or well, a bomb. if there's one thing about slang that we know, it's not the the received right slaps, view. No cap. Yeah, the the received view of slang is that it's no. like <laughs> anarchy. Slang is the opposite of grammar. Slang pushes against grammar. But what what I found to be the case is that slang often has much more complex rules for its deployment, and then those rules are even harder to articulate and teach to other people. You either know or you don't. It's highly ideological. Um, so that, that's the, uh, that's the thing. So I'll say a couple of things about what George had to say. First of all, again, confirmation bias is a feature, not a bug. So I'm very suspicious of discourses that don't take into account all that research about, uh, the cognitive evolutionary theory. It's just really persuasive stuff about how we develop confirmation bias to survive as human beings, because we're communicative and we invented reason. And they even go so far as to say we invented reason and argument because we want to find other ways to communicate with each other because that's the thing that has allowed us to survive is not reason but communication uh and they go into a lot of detail in this so that's the first thing the second thing is we've always had too much information because information is always selected out of noise by either people who are in authority or power or people who say this is what the information is and that's the 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 james glyke book i think too so i think one of the ways of approaching it is i think you're right i think that the here on election eve I think that the two parties have decided that it's not worth their time and money to try to persuade the other side on anything. What they need to do is get the vote out of people who, because based on their zip code and based on their skin color and based on their where they happen to live, they're probably going to vote for our party. And that's just really sad to me that that's, that's where we've come. Uh, Bentley says this interesting thing. I think this is great. Maybe we're able to format the information in such a way people can find the evidence they need in the moment based on their personal needs. I think that's great. Yeah. And also finding like, I don't know how to phrase it, but finding the information that can be warped into evidence. And I use that term warped because we can think about Aristotle and his idea of judgment in the rhetoric and talking about the lesbian ruler, which I think is like a great band name. 
but he's talking about he's talking about this, this particular <laughs> leaded ruler that they would use where you would warp the ruler the ruler was a fixed Length, maybe, I'm, and maybe. Wait, we're, no, we're talking about a literal physical ruler. Yeah, it's yeah. Like a unit of yeah, like when you're building something, you have this ruler, but it was made of. I lead. thought he visited someone on the island of uh, Isle of Lesbos for a second. Like, well, he probably did, but um, he probably did. But you take yeah. this and you can warp it. You can make it. You can heat it, and bend it in a way to where then it becomes fitted to the situation, and then you can judge if something is long enough based on whether you need a curve or an angle or something like that. So I think the history of that is super maybe, interesting. Maybe in Athens feel insecure. I'm because sure. we, well, we tend to think of warping and changing measures as manipulation and always bad. But Aristotle um, says something different. But I like the idea of um, finding, how to find relevant information. But it just seems like confirmation bias, if it's, if it's understood properly and taught, hey, we have this thing and here's how it goes. Um, Things like Google search results kind of re search results kind of warp the advantages confirmation bias could have, right? Um, but <clears throat> in terms of ah, yeah, that's the thing that I kind of know. That's the thing that I have been thinking of, and then you can offer that as a case because we already have built in this way. And so they did these experiments that are kind of cool in in uh, <clears throat> in the Enigma of Reason book where they um showed that when people's own arguments were put back against them, but it were in a way to where they didn't detect it, they came up with devastating arguments against it, and that was their belief. Mm -hmm. uh, Interesting. But what's what's missing, and what's missing, and it's kind of obvious it's missing, is time and space and resources for us to talk with each other slowly, System B style, yes. about issues. That's what's gone. What we have instead is the Commission on Presidential Debates with their 90 minutes where the audience is not allowed to react. What we have are twisted psychological experiments that belong somewhere like Guantanamo Bay. They probably don't belong there either, but um, twisted experiments. We have campaign commercials that are 30 seconds long with just name calling and ridiculousness that don't even talk about, like, what is what do any of these Democrats and Republicans mean when they talk about crime or when they talk about dangerous extremists? What do they mean? I think I know what they mean, but what do they mean? And, and they want you to fill in what they mean. It's, it's I, I guess. Well, it's not even an anthem, I don't think. I think they want you to not think. I think they want you to react and go vote, which is like the conclusion that you're kind of drawing and what you said a minute ago about this idea of like, well, they've kind of given it up. They say, there's too much information. And people have too many cognitive barriers to their um, thinking that we can't solve. So why don't we just try to take the people who already think our way and try to get them out to to vote? Yeah, I think uh, Bentley's on to it, exactly what we're trying to, what they're suggesting. Bentley in. The MVP. Uh, yeah, Bentley was on the podcast last week. Yep. Did you see that episode? Oh, okay. Well, you can go watch the VOD. I, sh I should go watch yeah, it. Yeah, or go watch it. Anchor.fm slash in the bin. And go watch it there. But, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So here's his comment, I think, is the idea of, like, how do we reduce the downsides? The downside to confirmation bias is that when we receive our information not in social context, when we receive it on a screen in, like, Facebook or Twitter or something, then uh, we are more likely to make very bad choices because there's no one pushing against it. It's not received in a, a community context. This is why... Um, I think George has a good point about um, mediation. So this is why in the time periods where you had newspapers, but the newspaper would come maybe to like the barber shop or the general store and people would be reading it out loud to each other and then commenting on it. You had much, much better system of evaluating evidence and evaluating reasons and arguments than any kind of modern day internet based fact checking could provide. Yeah. It's all very, very narrow folks. Plus, we're just kind of like we're sitting there with our confirmation bias and we're saying, yeah, that 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 tracks that tracks with what I think. And we're not terribly interested in the system. The governmental system is kind of in a position where it's like not really interested in helping giving us space or compensation or time to have the conversations we need to have to say, oh, we actually are all on the same track. I mean, I've seen TikToks that say literally like. I hate when the comments are turned off on a TikTok because I don't know how to make a conclusion. I don't. Yeah, isn't that wild? Until I see the TikTok. Comment. Yeah. And I'm like, what? I think that's confirmation bias right there. That's that's kind of the upside of it. That's like the recognition of reducing the downsides right there would be the recognition that I can't judge the factacity of this small Factacity. Video. <laughs> um, I can't judge it. 
because I don't have community engagement on what it's saying. I mean, I think my students today said their primary place they go for news is TikTok. Yeah, yeah, I and think that's, that's a, definitely true. That's a scary thought. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, people said, people said the same thing about television. People said the same thing about radio. Uh, look, I, it, this is me being an old head. I get yeah. it, but like, it, it is. I mean, it, I check things that I see because I know that TikTok doesn't have, you know, like a team of, or theoretically, we know this isn't actually true, but like the the belief with the, you know, that that a journalist is reporting on something sort of. You know, makes you feel like, oh, maybe somebody put two seconds of research into this. Probably not the case, but whatever. Um, definitely not the case, actually. But, like, you know, you don't have as much of a feeling that hmm, maybe somebody bothered to spend two seconds Googling this before they posted that. You don't have as much of that feeling on TikTok. So, like, I, I know people, though, I, that seems to be the general sentiment that people that get their news from TikTok have, though, is that, like, they they see what people are talking about on TikTok, and then they'll go to external sources to, like, verify or falsify that like it's just sort of the place where you get the statement and then most people i know that get their news from tiktok seem to have like some sort of level of understanding that maybe this isn't facts but this is at least where i can find out that people are talking about it yeah um, not that yeah, I, I wonder how that works i'm so old like, it is a it is a fire starter tiktok doesn't make a lot of sense i for guess me. is like one thing but like if it is the if it is the alpha and omega that is a disaster I mean, it. I, I think it, I mean, like you were saying earlier, whether it's good or it's bad, it is. Like, I don't know if I yeah. love it either, because, you know, a lot of times there there are some things that people talk about where I feel ridiculously grossly misinformed and, or underinformed. And I'm like, what am I even doing sitting here? Like, I need to Google 10 things to keep up with the conversation. Sure, and other yeah. times I feel like I'm like, this is incredibly relevant and I'm only seeing this on TikTok and people that aren't seeing it on TikTok probably aren't talking about it. Um so I don't know. I mean, it, it has its upsides and downsides, and we sort of live with it now. I think. Yeah, I it's guess. I mean, I'm that. I'm way out of the loop on on TikTok. I tell you, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. People yeah. will send me a TikTok once in a while, and it's just weird to me. Like, I just I'm I'm fascinated because I see what's happening, but it doesn't connect with me at all. What, what's so weird is you think as someone with ADHD <clears throat> designed perfectly for my brain my brain short attention span, and for whatever reason, it just does not click with me. Oh, I don't it, know it why. Yeah. And I do have to take TikTok like purges sometimes actually mm -hmm. too because the algorithm will like actually get away from me and I'll start seeing things that I know and it like I don't love and I actually like it affects my mental health in a very tangible way. Mm -hmm. I have to say I can't touch TikTok for like a month or I need to stop touching it or being on TikTok for as long as yeah. I am a day. But I, I think it when used with a certain level of like I don't think you can sit there because people doom scroll. They'll get on TikTok and they'll scroll for nine hours and they don't think about a single thing they're coming across and they're just doing it literally because they're like putting something off or they don't. It's like almost like an. Well, it makes them feel connected. I think it's probably doing a lot of social work for them. What they say, parasocial relationship, is what they say yes. in media studies. Yeah, I, I mean, oh, I, I have some opinions on parasocial relationship. Because yeah. I feel like these are the kind of people when they do those old <laughs> parasocial research things where they would say. How, how many friends do you have? And people say, oh, I have like 20 friends. Okay, name them. Uh, they can name like three people. Because it's like the media, their media habits give them the sense they have more friends than they actually do. Yeah. Or more human contact than they I mean, actually do. The, the whole idea of being like chronically online. Like, I, I think that people are like becoming resistant. Um, people are becoming resistant to takes that, to having discussions about ideas at all. So like somebody yeah, will post right. a statement that's like, oh, I believe X, Y, and Z. And then someone will be yeah. like, well, what about disabled people? And this person's like, you just assume that I meant to exclude disabled people without asking. Well, you didn't explicitly it. say it. So that's the world we're in. It's like people want to have that one up because it's about being um, true and woke and authentic yeah. and not about, um, oh, I could be wrong about this. It's well, the secondary that. or tertiary thing even because, you know, it's like people like, you'll be like, oh, well, you know, um, what do you think about this Harry Potter, blah, blah, blah. And they immediately like, well, J.K. Rowling's a turf. Yeah. And I'm like, well, is that really a response to the question I ask? We can we can take that and say, yeah, that's a problem and table that and then have this other conversation. Yeah. I don't understand why people have, maybe I'm a conservative. Maybe I'm revealing I'm a conservative here. But I just don't understand the um, woke order yes. of operations. Steve Yano, conservative Marxist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't understand the woke order of operations. I don't understand it to where it's like, it's exactly like, what you said. Like, I think blah, 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 blah. And they're like, well, you didn't mention first peoples. You didn't mention disabled people. Yeah. And they okay. That, like, How does that contribute to the conversation? Maybe make an argument. 
-hmm. everything is out of everything is assumed in these spaces to be from bad faith like yeah that's right there's no such thing as like a good faith well that is kind of where we are because people don't i think people only have that lever of it's either true or it's not to pull and so anything else is a bad faith. If it tries to circumvent that, it's a bad faith. I mean, so much has been in bad faith for a while that I think it's just a lot of cumulative distrust that has been that has yes. been like that we're just coming to terms with now. But at the same time, I don't think that that is productive no, in you any can't way, shape, or form. Like no, that. it's not. It, it's not moving. It, it's not really moving anything. Like it is mostly at this point, I think a way to lock conversations in place or to mm. exclude as opposed to include yeah. like, well, there's um, no point in having a conversation if it doesn't, isn't directed towards once again, revealing or rearticulating the truth we already know. Yeah. So this, this, this is again, back to the beginning of the stream where I was like, how weird that we teach people to be demure when they admit they're wrong. They kind of look down. They're like, look, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I was wrong about that position. Thanks for showing me that evidence that I, it's not done as a happy thing. It's not done with the feeling of a birthday. It's done with the feeling of a funeral. And that's wild to think about the impact that that has on how people look at everything from uh, cog- you know, so-called um, cognitive biases and, and fallacies to what the whole point of having a conversation would be. It affects every layer of it is that emotional connection to that. Well, a eulogy it, to yeah. my past thoughts the emo- <laughs> emotional damage how is a person supposed to learn anything if if the reaction that they're because i mean there's even this format that everybody knows of the classic youtuber apology where people like have memeified it and they like make a joke and they're like, and they're like this is my youtuber apology and, like, and they go this is a hard video to make yep yeah right and it's it's just frustrating because it's like well well, yes, some some things that YouTubers have to. I'm not saying that things that YouTubers have to apologize for are always ridiculous. In fact, a lot of times YouTubers do do ridiculous things. But like the point that I'm making is that like the fact that we have this idea of like what this apology is, and like when people make public apologies, that like if it doesn't fit what we feel like the right apology is, people get brutally attacked. Yeah, that's like, right. Even a person admitting fault, if you don't admit fault the right way, you're you're like never supposed to come back from this. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, they made their apology more about themselves. I'm like, uh, what is it supposed to be otherwise? Well, I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff. Explain the origin of, you know, their their fault without that being. I'm know, hoping I'm hoping Dan know. is going to come in here and chat with us. I do. I'm trying to really. encourage Dan, who's they been on the podcast the before. Like Google uh, when, they, when they count. Yeah. Well, he doesn't want to. You know, he doesn't want to be too out there. But I know he has a YouTube account, so I'm trying to convince him. Dan's been on the podcast yeah. before, and. One of my most popular episodes, we talked about the Toolman model. Great, that was what I was going to use. The, you remember like an hour ago when I was like, should I use the board? You want to put the Toolman model? The I board. was going to put the Toolman model. I bet you could do it. Oh, not by heart. I, yes, I have you to could. Google it. I bet you could. Oh, I don't know. You took my class. It's been a minute. This I know. Like, I can, I'm going to log in a banner and change your grade if you can't. No. I'm just kidding. I'll fail. Stri- anxiety, <laughs> anxiety through the roof. The fact that uh, I would, anxiety meter. I would, I would blank at the at the board. Yeah. No. no. I think you, I think you could probably do it. I bet you, you want to try. Oh, you, not, you don't have to. Not if you on don't there. Want to. Not oh no, it'll be fine. Nobody's watching right now. It's the perfect time. Oh. There would be the vod though. You have vod in. No, because there, there'd be a, there could be a record that I could go oh, back to. The record. For getting the tool. Ah, yeah, it could happen. It could happen. Um, but hopefully Dan will come in and make a comment, but I think it's kind of coming to the end of the stream because I got to go home and eat something. Nah, me too. Starting to think food might be a necessity. I have to, I have to eat my leftover Mr. Doc. Oh, I have to, I have to eat jealous. something and prepare for, and, and prepare for trivia tonight. Uh, oh yeah. What's the trivia to topic? It, it's also potpourri actually. Potpourri. Oh, okay. Even oh. a, it, it could be anything, even a boat. Dried you flowers and twigs. There's so many questions about dried flowers and twigs. Yeah, exactly. It's Monday. I have progressive Bible study today. Oh, very good. As opposed to regressive Bible study. That's, oh, those that's exist. on Wednesday. <laughs> oh, those exist. I didn't. That's I wasn't Wednesday. doubting it. I don't yeah. think they explicitly call them that, but yeah. I think two and a half hours is pretty good for a stream. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You think that's long enough? I'd I like mean, to go longer, but I kind of do feel like I need to go eat and everything. And and then tonight I have work too. I got to get ready for NCA, which we didn't even talk. I was going to talk about a little bit. I still haven't. Them? Well, I still have a paper to finish. How many oh, beignets do you plan to eat? Own. I plan to eat twenty on the first day. Perfect. Incredible. 
It's in New Orleans. I'm going to do a live stream from New Orleans, I think. What will be more blackened, platform. the chicken or your soul? It's hard for my soul to get any more blackened. Mm -hmm. Got to eat some crawdads. Yeah. We're going to do the whole thing, the whole thing. But um, I will. I do want to do some live streaming from NCA, the world's largest um, continuous annual Stanford prison experiment. <laughs> uh, I was about to still say, operating the world, today. The, the world's largest continually operating tequila open bar. Um, I wish it was an open bar. It's not. Uh, but um, the thing about NCA is it's just weird, like how seemingly intelligent people, you give them a title and say, oh, you're a very famous scholar, how they treat other people like dirt. So it's like um, the Stanford prison experiment run wild. Wow. I'm not going to lie your way. But I like NCA for reasons that have nothing to do with the structure. But I like seeing old friends. I like talking about ideas with people. I actually like going to panels. And I like the food. And I like kind of walking around and thinking, man, this is a cool job I have. I have kind of a cool life. So not so bad. But NCA, a lot of people are cynical about NCA. I'm pretty cynical about NCA sometimes, but I do think at NCA, everybody falls into their assigned roles very much like um, Philip Zampardo proved so long ago that people will take, even a role, if it's artificially assigned, people will take that role on as an identity and treat other people that way. And you see that at NCA, which is a little sad, a little, a little telling, but also just, you know, proof of the Zimbardo hypothesis. The theory proven again. But uh, anything we should close the show talking about? I guess I could talk about Toolman, the, the power of Toolman a little bit in this idea of how the warrant is always unspoken. So this is another thing that debate coaches get wrong, which is, well, um, the argument is all about articulating the warrant, articulating the warrant. If you have a bad warrant, a bad argument. It's hard to articulate the warrant by design. The warrant is always an assumption. It's always an assumption based on something that either is highly mimetic, like it looks like natural, the way the world naturally works, or it's highly ideological, something that's so burned into your way of thinking and feeling that it's not only truth, but the truth table, the Rosetta Stone for truth. So with the warrant like that, it'd be like the best way in is through the backing, which is kind of deep toolman stuff. So I don't know, maybe we can illustrate this on the board. Do you think this is a good idea? Sure. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm bad, so I'm assuming some people. Oh my gosh, wild Duncan cup. Has oh, been detected. alas. Sorry about that. Oh, is that yours? Yes, oh, it's okay. it's unfortunately a domestic Duncan cup. It went running around everywhere. Yeah. So we'll see if I can put this up here in a way that you guys can see. Uh, almost everybody <coughs> probably watching is familiar with the Toolman model, which is taught like this. Barbara Warnick, R.I.P. Um. Barbara Warnick uh, should, talked about this as the basic T. I wonder if this can even be seen. Not really. This might not be worth doing. I should write more in the center. But anyway, there's the basic model. So the conventional wisdom of people who do debate teaching and stuff. I should have written it more over towards George here. Let's try that. And in big in it. In big in it? Okay, I can embiggen it. Should I use like a color? Do you think red would show up better than black? Yes, use red. You think? Yeah. Okay, let's try it. You guys also let me know what people in the chat are saying. What I can do better. Not really visible, says Bentley. Yeah. Uh, how about it's showing up a little better with red. I don't know. I think it. Yeah, it's, it's I think okay. You can see that. I guess if you're watching well. on your phone, it's not gonna. It is backwards though. No, no, that's just for us. Okay. Everybody's seeing it correctly. I think. Are you seeing this as backwards letters? Probably not. Uh, we're seeing the mirror no, image. It, it looks, it looks a little yeah, backwards. we're just seeing a mirror image. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on our on our side, oh, but I don't think okay. the stream is. It's like you're a mirror. Every time I teach, oh, I read the definition of warrant. I can't mirror. remember it. Yeah. That so the definition weird. of the warrant is so the way that Toolman the way that Toolman talks about this is Toolman is trying to model not ideal argument, but the way argument happens in the everyday. So data is what do you have to go on? Is that question? So that'd be like the traditional evidence or proof. The warrant is how do you figure? So that would not be a question about evidence or anything. I think the warrant, I think debates about warrant get caught up in this too. Of like, uh, it's the same question of what's your proof for that is like, what's the warrant for that argument? Or what's the warrant in that card? Or what's the warrant in that piece of evidence? But it's like, how does this prove? How does this connect? But the warrant is so much more than just connection. I would think of it as the glue that holds the world together 
which then makes this assumption happen so rapidly that we might even call it system one thinking after Daniel Kahneman or system A thinking as Isabella talked about. So yeah, early in the podcast. So instead of thinking of this as the place to um, uh, the place to intervene, we can go into deeper Toolman model beyond the basic T that um, Dr. Um, Warnick taught me when I was a graduate student. Beyond the basic T, we can go into other deep Toolman, the deep Toolman lore, the backing. The backing is, well, when you ask the question, how do you figure? And the Warren is like, well, you know, when categories like, he's like, can you give me another example of that? And the backing is every other instance of that connective tissue being a valuable way to bring data to a claim. Right, so every other place in the world where you see this happening, right? Um, there's other stuff, but this is kind of what I want to talk about today. Is the backing is actually the thing, the place to go and say, can you give me another example of this reasoning working out well? Because the warrant is the kind of is kind of the question of reasoning, but reasoning, as we talked about before, is not the pure logic that we've departed from. Reasoning is the story and the narrative that we have made in order to add it's like ice cream ice cream was the evolutionary property communication and disagreement that has been identified as um in the cognitive um, evolutionary cognitive research we invented argument we're communicative creatures who invented logic and argument because we want different flavors of the thing that we've been so successful with so it's kind of an inversion of the traditional received view of the story which is we were logical and reason reasonable and we got off the track that's not at all. We're still on the same track we were of how we've been a successful species. If you, but I mean, this requires a lot of meta buy-in. You have to believe in evolution. You have to believe in psychology. You have to believe evolutionary psychology, which is a, uh, uh, you know, a scholarly field that's kind of new. <clears throat> so there's a lot there, but I was thinking about this today because we often feel that weight of wanting to agree with something too early. We're like, yeah, that's true. And you, we kind of feel ourselves rushing in. How can we interrupt the power of the warrant when the warrant's unspoken, ideological, burned in as mim mimetic or ideological? So backing is a way of doing that. And that's also a very nice civic way to inquire after and say, well, your reasoning seems unclear about this because people have trouble articulating the warrant because it's just so natural. Right. So I think that um, one of the ways of saying is, like, can you provide me another example of when this reasoning um, here, the backing here makes my finger look huge compared to George here because of optical illusion. But um, <clears throat> the um, the backing is what are some other parallel cases where this reasoning has worked? Yeah, that, that, that's what I'm thinking of right now about this. But the other mistake is the Toolman model is not a, mo a, a theory of invention. It's not argument invention at all. It is a way of assessing and thinking about um, how arguments work, but not how to create them. And that's another big mistake too, is people teach this as a way to come up with argument. Including and then it's like, and then it like, okay. I think, yeah, but I, kinda, but are you happy with the results you get? Not sense? always, but like, mm. I, sometimes I teach of it is like, teach it as a way of like, look, sometimes if you think about all these steps, even if you don't say them all, it's at least a way of considering covering all your, covering a lot of potential bases. So like the example we went through, and I usually call beta grounds instead of, instead of, so the claim we were talking about was like, a stricter law requiring you not to text and drive would would be affected would is necessary and the data we went on was like something like 1.6 million accidents a year are caused by cell phone use where cell phone use or texting while driving the warrant is always you're correct the part that they have trouble coming up for but what's the so what's like a piece of logic that would link those two together like the idea of like a stricter texting law and like that texting is causing accidents the warrant would be something along the lines of laws work to s reduce accidents or law or laws are effective in reducing in changing behavior mm -hmm. and then you your backing would be other examples where laws have affected driving behavior that was the part that they had so much trouble coming up with because the idea that like you even have to state that assumption would be was something that seemed so foreign to them. That's the part that I really wanted to yeah. get them across. I think it, I think it's because my analysis of why that didn't work, just I wasn't in your class, I didn't see it, sure. is that it was a top-down manufactured argument. If it was a claim that they came up with on their own that they legitimately believed, it would have come out much easier. I don't, I've, I've tried it the other way around where they've come up with the claim and it doesn't, it, it's tends they're not, to go They're not the used to way. being called out on their reasoning, but they'd be like, 
man, we just have so much work to do and it sucks. And I'm like, well, why? What do you, how do you figure? You know, and they're like, oh, well. So how do you teach this as invention? You don't. I don't think this is invention at all. I usually I teach agree. it from the perspective of, I usually teach it from the perspective of if you're trying to make this claim, like this claim of like that this, usually I teach this for the policy change speech. Like if this is mm -hmm. like the policy you're going to alter and this is going to work, you have certain sets of data that like indicate some evidence as to how this might work and go through like your warrant and backing, backing up like how the data exactly connects to your initial claim. And then you have like your other aspects of the tool and mo tool and model, which is your qualifier and your rebuttal, right? The qualifier being the degree to which you think that this is actually going to work, which is like somewhere between zero and hundred percent of the time. And your rebuttal is just taking into account all of the different opposing arguments that like could come in and you're either. Well, what's, what's interesting here, I mean, this is also, this is also, this is like a very, remember, Toolman is describing how uneducated people on the street make arguments. So the qualifier and the rebuttal, difficult concepts to understand, but these are things the arguer would offer. The person making the claim would offer these things, which throws people for a loop. The best qualifier I ever saw in my life, best example of this actually came from Cambridge, where Stephen Toolman was educated. And it was at a, a store, I can't remember, the, a department store. And their slogan was, never knowingly undersold. Hmm. And I'm like, that's a perfect qualifier. Because what the qualifier does is show the conditions under which you could be wrong and still be have a persuasive claim. So it's like, a, it's what George was talking about, it's like a steam release valve. So they're like, sure, we've been over, we've been undersold before. Someone's found a better deal. But if we knew about it, we would have made a better deal. Yeah. The, the almost like right. the guarantee of like we'll match right. any price you see in like the next quarter <clears throat> for this, you know, yeah. we'll never be undersold. That's a good example. Right. The other, the other, the rebuttal is also bizarre, bizarre because that's like admitting the it's like classical speech making. It's like admitting the conditions under which your claim would not be true. So it's like unless is usually the way that's marked. Toolman says unless is the word to look for. So the rebuttal is actually say well so blah 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 unless blah blah blah. blah. And it's actually offered as support for the claim. That's the weird thing here is this makes a claim more believable, right? Which the ancient rhetoricians noticed too when they said uh, you need the refutatio in any kind of speech, right? The refutatio comes in and says, uh, some of you might be thinking that I'm wrong because blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> That's correct, but I'm not because da, da, da. it's where you kind of bring up the opposition to your speech and you say, um, yeah, that's a great opposition. Here's how I deal with that. So you actually provide the conditions for your own unravel. Almost, almost the PR rule of like, you'd rather hear about the bad thing from you as opposed to mm -hmm. anyone else. Yeah, which so is like, an ancient idea. Yeah. Ancient idea. Every professor that teaches mm -hmm. IRAC always includes that you should include your counter argument in the analysis. Yep. But for some reason, they don't include it in the whole acronym, which is funny. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so this is, um, so yeah. So uh, this, Dan says it does look backwards. I wonder uh, how to fix that. Hello. Write backwards. I got yeah, you. I wonder how to figure. I can't write backwards. Maybe you could do it, Isabella. Yeah, I don't know. Now that we have the, the speed but how wild? How wild? I right. don't know why it would look so, mirror image. So the, the reason I don't necessarily teach it as like invention as much as I teach it is like this is one way to look at your argument to say, am I taking into account everything I might need to? Like, do I have a reason why my data and like do my reason why my, there we go. my claim match up with one another? I solved it. You don't you have to write backwards. Don't do anything. But actually. Let's see. Uh, oh, look, you were doing it great. <laughs> look at that. I was on the way. Amazing. I could just leave it. I'll, I'll go back. No, it's okay. You can just leave it. <laughs> I figured it out, Dan. Apparently, mirror camera is the default. I didn't actually want that. That's mirror camera good. is the default. See, I told you you could do the tool and model, Isabella. Look at that. No, oh, I'm just, I'm just Sticks with here. you after so many clients. Interesting that you call that the data and I call it the, I learned it as the grounds, but I don't know why that's different, but it's the same thing, I guess. I, or, when or, you started talking about it, I thought I was insane as well because I also remember hearing grounds. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I but, was like, did, you, did I forget? But it's the, so it's the whole, but the whole gist of it really is that I, I almost teach it as like a, a debugging method for arguments where it's like maybe you don't have to have all of these six things but if you go through your arguments and say like do I at least am I at least trying to take these things into account do I have a reason as to why my grounds and my claim match up with one another good 
Do I have like some reasoning as to why they're matching up? Do I have some reasoning why the reasoning itself makes sense? Do I have some backing mm -hmm. up for it? Like, am I at least not overclaiming something? Do I have taken into account some other arguments? It's usually a sign that you've thought through the mm -hmm. issues enough. That makes sense. So it's all just good argument philosophy too, because it's like, well, I mean, you know, Toolman's working at the same time as Popper. So I think that that's where the rebuttal is coming from, right? This idea of, of um, what are the conditions under which your argument is defeasible? So in contemporary argumentation studies, defeasibility is a, is a necessary. Oh, Larry's for most, here. Yes. Yeah, he is here. Uh, for most um, argumentation scholars, the conditions of the defeat or of the argument or the conditions under it being proved wrong are necessary part of the argument having any kind of persuasive weight at all to hold the water. We need to know what it won't, False won't hold. Falsifiability. Very that's falsifiability. yeah, that's Karl Popper's idea. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and then qualifier is the conditions um, is like, uh, you know, giving the um, intensity of the claim, which I think is an important thing to, I forget who it was, who's doing that at the same time. That's actually funny. Um, I saw. But the qualifier is very important because it shows the degree to which you subscribe to the force of the of the claim but the whole idea to me and and steve you, why if something if you can teach something as a method of analysis why can't it also be a method of invention because i think that's not how warrants work so i think that toolman is critiquing traditional philosophical argumentation which is uh syllogistic in nature and yeah. i think this is much more enthymematic in nature just to pretty broadly i don't think this is an enthymeme by any means but I think that um, what Toolman said is there's certain, like you can look at three different, it's all situational. So you can't really outline and say, okay, what's the warrant in that? Because when you teach it, you're in an uh, antiseptic room. You don't really have a good context. So the example he gives of like, <clears throat> you, you can't, when someone says you can't do something, what do they mean? Three examples. <clears throat> One is <clears throat> you're on the train and there's a sign that says, no smoking. Somebody lights up a cigarette. The conductor says you can't smoke in here. Obviously, this is about a rule or a law because the person is smoking. Yeah. So it's not about physical impossibility. The second one is uh, a weird one, but also kind of weirdly predecent and timely, which is your friend comes over and talks about how they're going to write a best-selling novel <laughs> about a man and his male sister. And they say, you can't write about a male sister. He said, sure I can and produces the draft of hundreds of pages about it. So as I mean, it wouldn't be socially acceptable, right? So this is kind of the idea, but now we have uh, trans rights and trans people much more visible. So we could write about a male sister is more acceptable, but some people would say, you can't call it that, or you can't talk about it that way. So it's this kind of social imposition. And the third one is uh, a very extremely British example that nobody ever understands, but I think it's hilarious, which is on the hunt, you can't talk about the fox's tail. But this is also akin to, in a theater, you can't say Macbeth. Um, Have you ever heard that? Yeah, yeah, it's bad luck. Exactly. So it's a superstition or a social, it shows an awareness of the culture and the traditions and the history of the activity. So here are three pretty innocuous examples of Kant having wildly different definitions and interpretations. So I think this speaks to how people, not, like when people are arguing this is why practice, oral practice is so important for teaching argumentation and teaching debate is you have to have people up doing it. You can't just do it as an analytic activity. Um, and it might be an argument for rhetorical criticism as well. You have to be doing it to learn it because I feel like um, when you're making the stuff, it kind of comes kind of naturally out. Oh, this is the connective tissue. This is how this is working. This is how this comes together. And I think that's like, <clears throat> so powerful because then afterwards you can say, wow, look at that warrant. Where'd that come from? And people say, I don't know. And well, and we can quote from uh, Robert Persig in the, um, the Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Well, it comes from the place the arguments come from, but mystery, you, the mystery, the mystery of the miasma. I mean, but weirdly, there's an assumption you're making here that I'm not making when it comes to the warrant, the idea that the warrant's enthematic and, you're assuming just because a rhetor doesn't say it doesn't mean that they don't know what it is, that they haven't thought of it, that they haven't considered it, that just because they didn't say it out loud to the audience, that they didn't allow the audience to fill it in for themselves doesn't mean that they couldn't have written it down, couldn't have considered it, couldn't have done the stuff on their own and just decided, I think the audience is probably fine, not not with me not saying it. No, I think an enthymeme, 
<clears throat> is a mass persuasion tool, right? I think Aristotle's pretty clear about that. But enthymeme is also the antistrophos of the syllogism, right? That's what the word Aristotle uses. How do we translate antistrophos? The best is Jeffrey Walker's translation. Where he calls it the twisted sister. The twisted sister. So I, I, I refuse to let D. Snyder yes. anywhere near this conversation. The twisted <laughs> sister. I think Jeffrey Walker is so brilliant. If you haven't read Jeffrey Walker book, read one tonight. They'll take you more than tonight. They're thick. But um, uh, the, the ancient teachers of this art or um, rhetoric and poetics in antiquity are just beautiful books. Just beautiful books. So I would say the enthymeme. So Toulmin is not interested in traditional rhetoric. What he's interested in is people making claims to each other in a variety of situations, including parliament, but also including the street, because he is um, very concerned, like everybody writing this period, of how the Nazis were so successful in persuading all kinds of se seemingly intelligent people to turn in their neighbors and friends to be murdered by the state. And this is horrifying. And lot they all took logic classes and they all got A's on fallacy tests. And But I would say the warrant is not an enthymeme one bit, because an enthymeme... It has that same kind of force because an enthymatic argument would say, oh, I feel compelled to do it. But I think warrants are functioning at all kinds of different levels than an enthymeme would. I also think Thomas Connolly, whose book I happen to have right here. Dun, da, da, da. Rhetoric in the European tradition. Thomas Connolly, amazing history of uh, rhetoric scholar, wrote this amazing essay about the enthymeme and how we don't even really understand what an enthymeme is at all, and nobody in the classical world really has a sense of it. That's a great essay, too. So um, the warrant, I feel like, is a better fleshed out theoretical thing than the enthymeme, but I do think that the warrant is a, it's also related to the cognitive biases of, like, um, confirmation bias and things like that. Yeah. Um, in the sense of, like, oh, I just know that this will connect. And so it's based on community sense. Yeah. So that's why the, con that, that's why confirmation bias is such a powerful tool. Because the law is very quickly cut to the chase when time is on, on matters and we can have that discussion. Like a great case study of this is Lane Scarry's um, essay about 9-11 where she talks about the Flight 93 timeline and how the people met in the back of the plane and had a deliberation and a vote yeah. and decided to do the, what they did on that plane and bring it down. Um, it's not what they wanted to happen, but they're... I'm they're sure it's not how they decided. That they're, they're they decided they were dead anyway and they made arguments. So, so you can see confirmation bias working pretty well in that narrative of how that went down and how the warrant is just such a powerful tool with getting to decisions when um when we need to now then that gets into isabella's concerns about system b and system a and all that stuff but anyway um we'll put up lavery's comment here um say more about george's blending of analysis and invention is it is it that invention is necessary for establishing our context and exigency perhaps analysis can only be given within a context I mean, I feel like the Toolman model helps with what we would call good old fashioned critical thinking, hmm. which is what, why, why am I believing that? So it is system B. Yeah. Why, why do I feel compelled to believe this? What's motivating that? Um, but I, I guess George could talk about his pedagogy himself. But the last thing I would say before I turn it over to him is that um, when you're teaching the creation of arguments in like a debate classroom context or a debate competition context, you're wishing away the human being. And I think a lot of debate coaches wish that humans didn't think like humans and humans didn't reason like humans, that they were better at reasoning. I don't know what that would look like or be like, but these same people also distrust AI to make decisions and make arguments for them. So you can't have it both ways. Um, I think that when people are making arguments out of a, out of a moment of, even if they're, even if it's switch side, if they're made out of that moment of imagining themselves convinced or whatever, then uh, you get these very powerful warrants that wouldn't count for much in a debate competition round because they wouldn't be neutral and all this. But I think it would teach you a lot about, wow, that connective tissue was in me. That's so weird. Where does that come from? How, how do I defend myself against myself uh, when I'm trying to make critical decisions, particularly on election eve? But anyway, I, I guess I'll turn it over to George to talk about that what Lavery is asking you about I guess, analysis is relationship to invention in your pedagogy. I, I guess, I don't know. I just find it hard to completely separate those two things. I think that if you can use a tool to analyze, I think you can also use it. You can use to build. I, I, I just don't like, if we're talking about like the rhetorical tools throughout like 
history. Like, I don't know why this cannot be used as a tool. Like, what, even if Toolman isn't intending it, as you're probably correct in saying, he is not intending it as a tool to build argument. I don't know what about it is inherently. Well, we could say, I mean, we could say it's a tool to improve argument. So then the building would be in there. Right. I think that both of those things can be true. You can like, be more aware I, I, of your warrants, but the warrant isn't the what I'm what I'm trying to say is the warrant isn't the entirety of what Toolman has to offer. I agree. I agree. There's a lot more to offer here. I think the qualifier is also a very important concept that I think sometimes sometimes a very important concept that gets understated in the course of the thing. You can get my qualifier. Yes, joke? absolutely. Okay. One hundred percent. Um actually not a hundred percent. Maybe I only got it sixty five percent of the way. Sometimes. Um, yeah, pardon me. You never knowingly misunderstood me. Yes. Just like the Jay Smith or whatever. I got to find that picture. It's a great fit picture. I, it, but like, you know, I also... qualifier in history. Like, for example, like, couldn't you construct a speech using Burke's Pentad, which is clearly not meant as a speech construction tool. It's meant as an analysis tool of rhetoric. But like... Yeah, I take it the other way, actually. <laughs> you really think, you think yeah, so? Because what the Pentad is meant to do is to change motive. So based on what you put forward, the relationships and the and the way you put the um, the terms forward, what you put in, in the foreground and the background can then change the motive. Because you say, no, let's not look at who did it. Let's look at how they did it. And then it's like, oh, I get another pathway to another motive. So it is like changing the argument in that case. Right. Right. So I think that that's like not, not an analytic tool. I don't think I mean, I think it's I think it's I think all these things that we're talking about are things that American rhetoricians have ruined over the years. Because when we think about the Pentad, we think about that essay about. Chepaquitic. And then when we think about Toolman, we think about some of the bad uses of that in um, quarterly journal speech and stuff. Um, anyway, here's my qualifier example from, I took a picture of this specifically because I thought this was the best example of the Toolman, um, the Toolman qualifier I've ever seen in my life. This, I actually took this in Cambridge. John Lewis, never knowingly undersold. John Lewis is a British. Uh, I thought we were talking about the civil rights later for a second. I was like, oh man. Damn. Well, John Lewis is also sharp. I bet he was never knowingly undersold either. Rest in peace. RIP to a real one. But um, yeah, I mean, I do think these tools can be used however we want, but then we also have to make sure that they're doing what we hope that they would be doing, I guess. So <clears throat> that's my caveat on that. But I would say sure. that the Pentad is was is specifically meant, I think that's more clear. The Pentad is specifically meant to say. If I change these ratios, I change the conclusion of the motives of the perp in the thing. So when we say, dun, dun. let's look at the let's look at the weapon they used. Um, oh, this person is like this and this and this. Oh, let's look at who they were. Let's look at their mind. Oh, let's look at the situation. Let's look at the time of day. Let's look at the way they did it. Let's look at what they hope to accomplish. And as you change all that, you can see. And Burke's whole thing was to show that nothing is really set in stone. We can always change. Motives are always a, an account that have to be defended. So that's the idea about the glorification of war. The purification of war is that we don't have to die to resolve these things. He wanted life to be more like, if everything is a stage, he wanted life to be more like a Shakespearean comedy than a tragedy. Good he, he preferred that better. The comic frame, as he called it. But um, never knowing the undersold, just like in the bin, never knowing the undersold. I don't know. I feel like we've been undersold. Maybe not, maybe not knowingly, but we've definitely yeah. been undersold well, before. We don't have any competitors because the debate and rhetoric podcast space, nobody wants it. So we are we are squatting, but are you really squatting if no one's trying to evict you? Nah, you're just standing somewhere. You're loitering, <laughs> which isn't as <laughs> we're cool the, as squatting. We're the loiterers of podcasting. <laughs> yes. The original loiterers of podcasting. I think so. I think so. But anyway, I, I do have to go because i got to go home for my fresh direct yes. order. Enjoy. I don't want to miss my fresh direct order. <laughs> Absolutely not. But um, thank you guys for coming and hanging yeah. out so long. Thanks for having me. Nice thanks for, for having you, I didn't know if you meant to stay this long. No, I, I, I mean, I'm not doing anything else. Thanks, oh, for, okay. thanks for listening to the best podcast you've never heard of. I was actually going to work on some applications. So. Oh, great. Isabella, George, thanks for coming on. We'll do this uh, next Monday, too, probably. But I don't know if they'll be here. But I'll come on and talk. So put in your calendar. And you can always watch the VOD on Twitch. You can watch it on YouTube or you can go to anchor.fm slash in the bin. And of course, if you like what's going on, always feel free to support the podcast with a generous donation. Really uh, generous. If I win the Powerball tonight, I'm going to run for president with that money. And uh, happy birthday, Sophia Zinger. Yeah. And happy, birthday, happy birthday, Sophia Zinger. 
You better make good on that. Um, here are the places you can watch. Twitch.tv. There'll be a VOD. The VODs expire, though. YouTube is a better bet for that. But then I also don't have a ticker for um in the for in the bin on uh we sitting on, here. I'm supposed to be a franchise. Oh, that's player. the classic We're opening. We're yeah. talking about practice. We that was the classic here. one. Yeah. I don't I don't think I've not a game. That was from a, a long game. time ago. Not a game. Yeah, yeah. We're in here first. talking about practice. Yeah. But consider donating if you like it. That's gonna bring us to a close for today's stream. Thanks for joining us. And uh Thursday. Kate Morrison will be on. We'll talk about union fallacies. Thursday oh. morning at 11 is the next In the Bin podcast. Oh, man, I wish it was on for that. I got plenty. Yeah, oh, unionizing fallacies. fallacies. Oh, wow. So um, fallacies are kind of in the air these days. I really like talking about them. So, um, yeah, I will see you guys on that stream. But for now, goodbye, goodbye. Should I end it now? Yeah. Okay. If you want. If, no, I, if you, you just want to be awkwardly blinking more, let's uh, let's do a freeze frame and then we'll end it. Okay. We'll be like, ha. Huh.